in the name of Allah, who is the most beneficent and the most merciful. So, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, educators, and advocates for education, equity, and success. It is my utmost pleasure to welcome you to this conference today. I'm Hina Kafil. You, many of you know me very well. I am director and PD head at PPDCI. By the grace of Almighty Allah and your support, PPDCI has completed its one year of excellence and community service today. We initiated our first ever boot camp the same day back in June 18, 2022. What else can be better than speaking and planning about our own contribution in education equity and access on this very special day for PPDCI and for all those who are being associated with it. Today, we gather here with the shared vision, a vision that every individual, regardless of their background or circumstances, should have equal opportunity to access quality education around the globe. And in a world where knowledge is power, education serves as the foundation for personal growth, societal progress, and the fulfillment of human potential. However, we cannot ignore the glaring disparities that exist in educational system worldwide. Far too often individuals face barriers that hinder their access to education, preparing cycles of inequality and depriving them of the chance to thrive and contribute fully to society. Today, we come together as agents of change, as catalysts for a transformative movement that seek to address these inequities head on. We recognize that education is not merely a privilege for the few, but a fundamental right for all. By highlighting the importance of equity and access in education, we strive to create a more inclusive and just educational landscape, one that empowers every learner to reach their highest aspirations and maximum potential. This conference serves as a platform for dialogue, collaboration, and action. It is a space where diverse perspectives converge, where innovative ideas are nurtured, and where solutions are forged. Together, we will explore the multifaceted challenges that hinder educational equity and access. And more importantly, we'll uh, chart a course towards tangible and sustainable solutions, inshallah. Throughout our time together, we'll hear from esteemed speakers who have joined us from many of different countries, researchers, practitioners, and individuals who have dedicated themselves to dismantling barriers and creating equitable education systems. Their insights will definitely inspire us. Their experience will educate us and their success will embolden us the push boundaries of what is possible. But let us remember, this conference is not merely an intellectual exercise or a collection of ideas. It is a call for an action, a call to harness our collective wisdom, resources, and influence to effect real change. It is a reminder that each one of us has a role to play in shaping the future of education, breaking down the barriers and building bridges of opportunity for all. As we embark on this journey together, let us embrace the principles of empathy, collaboration, and resilience. Let us challenge the status quo and envision a future where every child, every learner, regardless of their race, socioeconomic background or geographical location can realize their full potential through education. And may this conference serves as a catalyst for transformative action, sparkling ripple effect, and that will, you know, rise us from the average caliber and rise our communities, our nations, and our world on the whole. Thank you, and let us commence this remarkable journey towards education equity and access with the roadmap of the day. Let me tell you and let me share with you, let me take privilege of sharing with you that today is a very, very special day for me and for all of all of them who have been associated with the PPDCI for last one year. This is the day of anniversary. And I thought, why not to talk about this very pressing topic? And today we are talking about education equity and we are talking about access of education. I'm very honored to have our esteemed guest with us. We have Ms. Dina with us and we have uh, Madam Jenny Lewis, who is the Mentor for all of us, let me explore down the list who else have, have, have joined us from the guest list. And I'm so glad to see Miss Elia has also joined. The rest of the guests will be joining us very soon. 
and allow me to read from the chat room as well because I can see a lot of messages have been popping up. So let's see who have joined us from where. Okay, so we have Bisma Latif, we have uh, Alia Mukhtiar, and then we have Dr. Asma with us, Ms. Maria Bhutto, and uh, Mr. Pratap Kumar from Sen, Mr. Kailash Kumar, we have Amjad Jokhyo, we have Zay Fatma, Sheen Adnan, Iman is with us. Welcome on the board, Iman. Vijay Kumar has joined us, and Mr. Asan Das has joined us. Madam Jenny Lewis from Sydney, Australia, she is with us right now. And she says here is winter and it's evening over there. And looking forward to hearing from some amazing speakers tonight. Yes, very sure. We have Shifa Abdul Abdulaziz, Zarina, Maria Bhutto, Kamal Ram, Salma Kashmiri, Aisha, Maria Khan. Okay, here it's very hot in Pakistan. That's what Maria says. We have Laiba and Hinawasi with us. Sajida has joined us. <clears throat> Firdaus have joined us from Egypt. We have Muniba Azim from Pakistan. Usama Abro has joined us from Hyderabad. Sayyida Munaza Zahid, Hina Mirza, and the list goes on and on and on. Excuse me if I cannot read your names and the greetings, but thank you very much for warming up your fingers and for very active participation. And we have Emmanuel from Ghana and Saima. Perfect. Welcome, everyone. And let's celebrate the day when PPDCI you know, came into being from the intent and from the dreams. So let's begin the journey and uh, let me take you through the roadmap of the day. And I'm very sure many of you had been through this roadmap already. You are aware of the agenda, but then too, let's, for having a formal beginning, let's go through this. Okay, I have some technical problem on my screen, cannot present at this moment, but that's perfectly fine if we can. All right. So ladies and gentlemen, this is the roadmap of the day. We already have began with recitation and the welcome talk is nearly completed from my side. We are going to have the very first talk by Ilya Bhutto and she'll talk about teacher quality and training. We'll have digital divide by Mega Cervantes, and that would be beginning by 3.45 to 4.10 p.m. We'll uh, hear the talk of achievement gap by Janet, and Janet will start by 4.10, we'll end by 4.35, inshallah. Then, meanwhile, we'll stop for a while, and we'll look at the year, what had been uh, going with PPDCI, and what had you been experiencing. Once that's over, <clears throat> once that's over, We'll speak about socioeconomic disparities and Gina will carry on with this topic. And by the end, we'll have multilingual education by Ethel Campos. We will have closing ceremony by PPDCI mentor, Madam Jenny Lewis. And she has joined us right now and she'll be staying with us for the entire conference because she'll be doing the closing thing. Thank you very much, ma'am, for sparing this much time. By the end, we have a very special segment and that is recognition and gratitude segment through which we'll be presenting the, the certificates and membership cards to the presenters of PPDCI who had been with us. And here you can see the list of the speakers once again, the flyer you had been through. So I'll hand over the stage to this remarkable lady, Ms. Ilya Bhutto, who is making a lot of contribution in the field of education in Pakistan. Ms. Ilya Bhutto, welcome on board. And uh, I am so glad and honored and humbled to have you with me. This is the certificate we are presenting you in advance. And it's, this, this says in recognition of the unwavering commitment, exceptional leadership and valuable contribution, we extend our heartfelt appreciation to her for the dedication and efforts which have significantly enhanced our organization and positively impacted teaching fraternity. Our team and the goals we have accomplished together really have your contribution majorly. Dear Ms. Ilya, and let me tell the, the audience about uh, your contribution in the field of education by sharing your profile, which was really intense and rich. And I was compelled to take notes for that. 
So Ms. Ilya Bhutto is serving as lecturer in TESOL at the Begum Nusrat Bhutto Women University, Sathar. She owns an MPhil <clears throat> in English. Please excuse me for my very bad throat today. So she owns an MPhil and English, and she has national and international certifications. Her area of interest are reflective teaching, integrating technology with language learning and teacher training. So Ms. Celia, the stage belongs to you. I'm sure you are with us right now. Ms. Bhutto, over to you now. You are on mute, Miss. Can you please unmute yourself? Oh, assalamu alaikum. Am I audible? Yeah, you are audible now. Okay, thank you, Miss Hina, for this rich uh, introduction. And I'm honored to give my talk on the topic as well. And I think that that could be beneficial for the teachers, educators, and all the audience who are actually listening to me now. For sure, looking forward to it. Thank you. Uh, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Assalamu alaikum. Good morning. Good evening to all of you. And sometimes, if it is good night as well. So, if uh, there is a time difference, and uh, because we are having the national and the international audience with ourselves, uh, let me have a quick or brief introduction as Ms. Hina Kafid has already done. It's me, Idi Ali Bhutto from Sakhar, Pakistan, and I'm serving as lecturer in TESOL at the Begum Rasad Bhutto Women University, Sakhar. My current topic that uh, is going to be, I'm going to be delivered that is about the teacher quality and the training. And uh, obviously we think that the quality of a teacher is going to be enhanced with trainings and with the multiple sessions. So uh, here are some key concepts that which I'm going to give a talk through. One is about the teacher quality and the teaching quality okay then it is about the teaching effectiveness appraisal about the teacher performance and competence teaching assessment and evaluation and professional development i think that many of you have listened these terms or these uh, words in your career or like you know if you are even in service teachers so most of the courses actually offer these terminologies and some of our courses are actually based on these things or these terminologies so uh, I have an activity here with you. So what do you think that what are the good qualities or what are the qualities of a good teacher? And I would like to ask you that share your responses in the chat box. Okay, so I'm having receiving some responses here. Let me read some of them to teach well. Okay, being confident, empathy, motivational, I guess all of these are the good qualities suggested by the Bina Bukhari mentor leader and uh, Shifa punctuality. A good teacher should be friendly. A good teacher should be cooperative. Okay. Okay, uh, Miss Hina, capable for the mold herself with the students, a leader, okay, creative, who can demonstrate if effectiveness method and the assessment methods. That's good, that's good. Okay. And uh, what do you think that if you are a teacher, how can you can convert yourself into be a good teacher? Or do you think that a teacher can be good or a teacher can be bad, or it is all about the circumstances which actually involve a teacher into the certain behaviors?
Okay, Shifa says that sometimes it's about the circumstances and uh, a teacher can manage every situation. Okay. All about the circumstances in the most of the courses, yes. I can convert myself into a good teacher by understanding, keep listening. Okay. Now, basically, uh, this is a framework suggested by the researchers that what are actually the qualities of a good teacher. As we are having, or oh, sorry, as we are moving in the 21st century, what I think that we need to develop the higher order thinking skills as well, or even the lower order thinking uh, skills as well. I think that our classroom should have certain activities, should have certain uh, teaching content that is based on how we can increase the uh, higher order thinking skills and it also can help them or it also can uh, give them a way forward that they can implement their knowledges, they can implement their learning into their uh, practical life as well. And obviously it is about the facilitating learning as well. I need to see that what are my learners need. I really need to see that how my learner can learn better or how my learner can have an effective uh, classrooms as well. And obviously I cannot forget that what are the mission and what are the visions of my uh, institute where I am going to teach or where actually I am teaching. I cannot isolate the mission and I cannot isolate the vision of my institute. Like for example, if I'm going to talk about my own university, uh, they have the vision of uh, empowering women through socio-economical establishment. Obviously, it can be done when we are going to give them certain activities after completing their degree so they can go in the market and they can have the better socio-economical empowerment as well. And conductive the learning environment with the ethical practices. I think that this is a, a very sensitive topic or this, this, this needs to be uh, talked about more. For example, I need to convert. Uh, I need to conduct certain environment where my learners think that they are not being bullied. Okay, where I think that maybe they are not uh, going to listen a negative remark from my side. For example, and when I when I'm going to talk about the ethical practices, I need to respect their religion. I need to respect their culture. I need to respect their backgrounds as well, no matter which background they are from. And I need to actually, uh, whatever the resources I have with myself, I need to develop and I need to share the learning resources. They maybe can be free of cost. Like for example, I need to uh, focus on, or even uh, what I need, what I do in my classrooms as well. I need to integrate the technology into normal classrooms. For example, if they have a mobile phone, obviously I cannot live through a mobile phone and they obviously cannot leave the mobile phone. Now I am using this cell phone in my classrooms to see that how actually they can use this particular gadget. And uh, in utilizing teaching and learning things, what I think that whatever they are going to learn or whatever they are going to uh, talk about the things that they actually develop the things. And it is not all about the things that if they are going to learn about the maybe, let's suppose the present simple tense and how they are going to use that particular present simple tense in their professional life, okay? Or in their uh, things when they are going to outside and engaging the professional development, even for my students. Now let's suppose, uh, let me give you an example of my previous semester. In popular fiction, my students has to arrange a, a kind of get together or a kind of a theme party where what they do in the teamwork, they arrange a party, they know how to uh, calculate the amount, they know how to even arrange a venue, you know, ordering all the things and having a, a fun learning activity. And also, obviously, I asked them to write a term paper as well. And two of my students have actually presented the um, 
research paper in uh, the national conference that was actually held in Faisalabad. If I'm not wrong, maybe it's in Faisalabad or that was in the Lahore. Now, in the teacher effectiveness, what I think that a behavior and the competencies of a teacher can be a helping hand for the learners to achieve milestones in their professional or in their the personal life. Because I think that a teacher need to help the learners not only in the professional life, but also can be a helping hand for their personal lives as well. And uh, in the competencies, it is not only about the knowledge, okay? It is not only about that how to teach, but it can be like how I can be beneficial for them and how can be uh, uh, I can help them to come up with their maybe sometimes of their traumas, okay, or sometimes of their anxieties or sometimes of their fears, whatever they're uh, having. Now, like, like suppose, like if my student is having um, the speaking anxiety, so not necessarily that I need to ask him to speak in front. Maybe he can be a good writer or she can be a good writer as well. So I need to think that what skills my learners have and how actually I can utilize them and how actually I can polish their skills in their um, personal life and also in their the professional lives as well. Okay, now this is about the teacher appraisal. Now, if I can connect this teacher appraisal sites with the teacher's uh, competencies and the professional one, so I can see that what are is the formal, uh, formal reviewers uh, what are the, uh, I can say that uh, like in the end of the year, every student, sorry, and every teacher receives their feedbacks. Now, whatever the formal reviews of their professional feedbacks are even shared by, shared with the teachers and shared with the students as well. Now, actually who conduct this assessment or who conduct this evaluation for the teachers? Now. Obviously, uh, there are some certain cells like quality enhancement cells. They ask or they even uh, share certain performance with the students where they mark and the reviews are shared with the teachers and the reviews. And through that, actually, the teacher's performance is being judged or the teacher's performance is being marked. It can involve their uh, promotions. It can involve their um, further sources as well. All the things and all the uh, annual performances when it is shared by the teacher, it is not only by the student. Actually, it is by the committees and it is by the solely the observations that is conducted by the a particular department sometimes. And even if I can talk about the school, so uh, there are certain classrooms observations that are being marked and where uh, the coordinator or where I can say uh, the uh, principal or vice principal jump in the classrooms and they start evaluating the teacher's Things. So all the teachers' um, criteria or the, all the teachers' uh, personality sometimes is based on the teacher appraisal as well. Now, uh, I just want to ask from you that do you think that appraising a teacher and teacher evaluation both can be same? or both are these slightly differences because in the teacher appraisal, it is all about the teacher's performance, reviews shared by uh, the reviewers, shared by the committee members, or even shared by uh, the persons who are the part of the teacher evaluation. Are they same or are they uh, uh, just a bit different from the others? Okay, uh, Abdul Rashid said that both are different. Like how? Uh, can I have uh, the further discussion over that? In the teacher appraisal, I can say that it is about uh, the performance reviews that are shared by the particular um, members or particular uh, cells in the certain organizations. Okay, Amja um, Jokyu says that both are different. Uh, Vivo Y21, both are different. Okay, yes, I just received a comment that performance is reviewed by the student. 
Yes. And uh, right. Teacher appraisal process. Uh, Hafsa says that teacher appraisal is a process of the evaluating teachers' performance, while teacher evaluation involves providing teachers opportunities for the growth and development. Yes, right. Okay, performance is something uh, that can be evaluated by the department as well. Yes, right, Abdul Rashid. Evaluation is a broader process, yes. Uh, EIM yeah, won't find. Both are present in the determination of the teacher's effectiveness and the performance level. Uh -huh, okay. So can I get some more comments and I can move on the, for this slide, appraisal always comes from the department. Okay, like the department recommendations, how the department thinks. Peer evaluation is, yes, uh, we will talk on this uh, in the uh, next slides. Now, yes, the next is about the Teacher performance, obviously uh, the teacher's performance part, I can say that it is about the instructional behaviors, it's about the classroom management, and it is about the students' outcomes. What my learners demanded and how actually, how much I provided them or how much I was able to uh, address their needs and how much I was able to make them comfortable in my classroom or uh, how was the learning successful or the learning was not to extend the successful that it should be or even that it mean to be. But on the other hand, if I talk about the teacher competence, it is about the desirable qualifications to teach. Like for example, in universities, we have uh, the mandate, we have um, a kind of, rule that only ample holders can teach towards the university but if we go on the schools or to the colleges we just have the 14 years of education or even the 16 years of education and subject command could be and the teacher need to manage and monitor what my learners are doing in my classroom and how actually they are going to uh doing in the upcoming days and the practice, what I am making and my experience, I obviously need to learn. I need to reflect back what were the, my teaching experiences, what, what things I did in the previous semester, if I'm going to deal with the subject in my upcoming semesters as well. And obviously, the thing that I mostly focus on that is the teachers as the members of learning community. We teachers uh don't think that we cannot learn or we cannot uh, talk about the learning aspects once we own even the phd degree if it is not about my degree it is about even i can learn the things from my students as well i can learn the things uh from uh, the daily routine or anything in the performance we will be talking about the behaviors okay in the classrooms even sometimes even we can talk about uh the behaviors obviously with the organizational purpose uh, people as well. And on the other hand, competence is about the subject qualification and the things how we can learn and the things how can we go further on. Now, in the teacher assessment, we can uh, typically talk about there are the certain specific domains okay there are the certain specific targets that uh, the institute or the organization is going to judge or evaluate the teacher on the certain task because obviously every institute or every um, organization has certain parameters to talk about and that could be different from one institute to another institute as well and obviously, if a teachers are being assessed, what I think that they have the uh, better chances to prove themselves or they have the uh, better platform to improve their teaching methods, strategies, and that's how the learners can think or that's how the learners can have the better opportunities 
for having the maybe the good teachers and on the other hand the teacher evaluation it can be the broader uh, perspective because here we can talk about the summative and the formative uh, assessments as well for example and obviously it the main thing of the teacher evaluation is that to improve the teacher quality now obviously if the teacher is not being assessed or even the teacher is not being evaluated i can say that they are there is no room for that particular teacher who is not um, open to learn new things because on these things that training are based on these things we come to know that what are uh, the some weaknesses and what are the some strengths of the particular teachers so that's how the teachers are being trained and that's how the teachers can shape the in the better way now i want to engage uh, the audiences as well can you share some teaching evaluation strategies or even ha have you been a part of uh, certain things like uh, let me give you an example uh, my classroom was observed when i teach sometimes even in the university and when i was in the school there was the this casual teaching observations it's time to evaluate and assess students rather than a teacher uh don't you think that then uh how can we uh, make the teachings better, Abdul Rashid? Classroom observation, immune, students' feedback, peer feedback, self assessment. Okay, students' anonymous comments that can be the students' <laughs> feedback as well. Frequent observations and providing them the feedback, peer assessment, constructive feedback, evaluation interview by the MON surveys. My question was that, can you share certain strategies for the teacher evaluation? Peer students, uh, classroom observations, fine. Okay, give a chance to the students and engage the way that, that they can enjoy and learn by the Hina. There's a text from uh, Sajjan Mal. Students' feedback, maybe uh, anonymous comments, style communication, fine. Okay, Abdul Rashid, you said that you are totally against the teacher's evaluation. Okay, fine. Now, here are some strategies for the teacher evaluation, like classroom observation, students' outcomes, teachers' teaching portfolios, evaluation, students' evaluation of teaching, self-evaluation, teacher test, professional conversations, peer evaluation, and parent feedback uh before you know going for these evaluation strategies what i think that for example if i am going to being evaluated okay if i'm going to being observed i don't have the fear of the thinking that maybe i'm going to be degraded no whoever is making these uh, evaluation strategies they need to be talked with the teachers communicated with the teachers and then the policy can be led or the policy can be made on the evaluation strategies where all the teachers or all the employees of the organization agree like you know there they cannot there must not be a fear from the teacher side okay there must not be a kind of burden like for example how i am being to be evaluated no it should be a friendly environment where I can improve myself, okay? Because um, if I am not, uh, what I think that if I'm not being observed or if I'm not being evaluated, how could I come to know about my uh, good points or about my the weak points? And on the other hand, it should not be uh, led emphasis only towards the students' uh, comments. No, it 
should done in the ongoing processes like you know classroom observations okay then the teachers portfolios need to be reviewed and obviously there should be some kind of professional conversations like how can i improve more how can i engage more my learners in the better way and parent feedback only can be incorporated in the schools not in the uh, universities or even in the colleges now, obviously, the professional development is about the teaching trainings. Obviously, when we are going to train a teacher, I actually am going to identify my own strengths and my own weaknesses. And obviously, providing them the constructive feedback, okay, which motivates me to learn rather than not like, you know, that actually demotivates me to not to learn. Okay, and obviously guiding the teachers towards the adequate professional development and the programs and obviously providing them the uh, opportunities to develop their careers rather than, you know, giving them the negative feedback. We need to motivate the teachers on the certain programs. Yeah. There are the certain frameworks, for example, British uh, Council Continuing Professional Development ask on the awareness, understanding, engagement and the integration. Now, for example, if teacher need to be aware about the latest terminologies, latest things, latest researches, and obviously teacher need to understand as well. Okay, and it needs to a classroom should be engaging and it should be integrated with the learning outcomes and with the upcoming uh, things or the transformation. But I think that being an ELT teacher, my classrooms need to be engaged. My classrooms need to be uh, more fun learning activities rather than going only for the passive listening or the passive learnings as well. On the other hand, hand Cambridge assessment teachers teaching framework is about the foundation development, profession, and being as for, uh, expert in the uh that particular field they think that a teacher need to be uh we'll talk about the things that what need to be uh teach and what are the basic fundamentals for my teaching as well and a teacher need to be developed and it the teacher needs to be proficient in the particular scale or sorry in the particular language skill that is going to be taught it could be second language and it could be foreign language so i need to be uh proficient in that language and obviously i I, I, I can be expert in my domain and I can be, um, I can have the better understandings for my teachings outcomes as well. And European uh, profiling grid, it actually uh, talk about the trainings, qualifications, key competence, enable competence and professionalism. Now, here we can say that they're talking about the trainings, okay, and the qualifications and what are my competencies, how actually I can convert those competencies in the professionalism. And they are the six uh, stages for their professional development or they are the six stages for uh, making the teacher into the better way. Okay, so uh, this was from my, my side, and uh, if you have any questions, so please. Thank you so very much, Miss Elia. And uh, let me tell you very candidly, your talk has paved the way for arranging another session for self-regulated learning for the teachers. So congratulations for being so nifty and so good and so on the dot. Thank you very much. I cannot find um, any such questions in the chat room. Yeah. But all we have in the chat room is uh, the positive feedback and the appreciation. So thank you very much. Yes, thank you. And uh, I think that I did my best uh, and uh, I tried to actually keep it more simple rather than going for uh, the things that are, uh, you know, more uh, complicated because here I can see that some of the uh, them are the in-service teachers and some of them are also the uh, pre-service teachers as well. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Okay, thank you very much, Ilya. We'll move on forward. And in case if I have any questions, my team is collating those and we'll be referring those questions to you even after the session. Sure, thank you. Thank you, Hina. Thank you very much. So, ladies and gentlemen, we are moving on further 
and digital divide one of the very pressing topics is going to be the next topic which will be presented and catered by mr amigal cervantes he is an english teacher with over 16 years of experience he has been teaching high school students and holds a ba in english and a masters degree in education mr amigal cervantes is a technologist who enjoys incorporating technology into his lessons to make them more engaging and interactive for his students and the teachers whom he trains and that is what i have experienced at my own he is also a microsoft and google certified teacher trainer as well as the founder of the umbrella academy and it's been very long he's been associated with the ppdci since the inception and since the start of ppdci we have seen him helping us to grow so mr amigal cervantes here goes the certificate through which we really say thank you for all your efforts and what you had been doing for us so thank you very much here is a token of appreciation from our side and we title you as our ppdci edtech advisor thank you thank you very much everybody thanks for being here today okay yes i, I am miguel cervantes and today we're going to speak about digital divide <clears throat> let me share my screen okay good thank you very much okay wait wait a minute you are very welcome now the stage is yours and the next 25 minute journey is going to be all about edge tech very good okay perfect very good so it's here okay good okay can you see my screen yeah your screen is very yes. visible yeah clearly visible okay Okay, so listen, let's, let's begin with this topic, which is digital divide. Digital, digital divide is so important in any country in the world. It has several um, ways, okay, and several ways in, in which it influences um, society in, in the world. Also, it has uh, several causes and several consequences for any, for any part of the world. But first, let's begin by defining what is digital divide. Here, we have the topics that we will study today, that we will see today, which, which is what is meant by digital divide? What are the causes of the digital divide? <clears throat> also, another topic is uh, what are the consequences of the digital divide and what can be done to reduce the digital divide? Let's start a definition, okay, which is not mine, it is by Van Dyck, 2006. The digital divide refers to the gap between individuals, households, businesses, and geographic areas at different socioeconomic levels, concerning their opportunities to access ICTS and use them effectively. So data device not only refers to the lack of um, computers, or to the lack of laptops, no, it also refers to the lack of internet access or good quality internet access, and also refers to the different ages, okay, between elder people and, and young people. Some of the characteristics of digital divide is describing technology divide between countries, demographic groups, and economic areas. It is a technical, economical, and social issue which covers the difference in availability and use of modern technology. It means <clears throat> that it has several characteristics for digital divide, not only one way for digital divide. Here, for example, in Mexico, uh, one of the main problems is, is the lack of internet for all the country, especially for those regions which are far away or which are not uh, near okay, to main cities. Okay, look, at, look at the next. Other characteristic of the digital divide is the divide that people experience can depend on many aspects like age, status, and location. As I mentioned previously, age, it means that people, for example, who are young, okay, who are older, for example, maybe they don't have uh, access to internet. Obviously, because they are afraid of using internet, they are they are afraid, okay, of on, on technology, and the status. Yes, for, for example, families or people who are kind of wealthy, who are kind of rich, they always will have the best opportunities for technology and for internet. Location, obviously, because uh, maybe um, it can also happen same in Pakistan as it happens in Mexico. Some regions are not reachable for internet. Even, even government has tried to improve uh, or has tried to change the situation. So far in Mexico is not quite possible yet. 
Okay, let's, I hear a group with a myth about digital divide. Many people believe that digital divide only refers to internet access, but it also refers to access to technology, like tablets, smartphones, tablets, laptops, etc. For example, here in Mexico, during the pandemic, <clears throat> obviously all the schools in Mexico closed down and they sent their students to the houses. However, however, one major problem was that not all the students had a possibility to have a laptop on their own. So they had to wait for their parents to arrive home and use and use the, the parents' uh, phone, okay, or the, or the, the parents' uh, laptops. Digital divide. All countries experience a digital divide at one or another level. At the national level, the yes. digital divide describes the difference between those who have easy access to modern technology and those who have the needed skills to make the use of internet. That is why I mentioned, okay, <clears throat> maybe, maybe you, you can have digital divide in, sorry, in, in two ways, uh, sorry, in two ways, okay, which is national and for in, in the country, in a state, okay? That is why that was digital device is something difficult to, to face and something difficult to solve. Okay. So here it says, at an international, international level, the digital divide describes the difference between developed and developed country. This is also important to remember. So not only money, not only job opportunities, but also the kind of um, digitally developed students countries have. Obviously, obviously, uh, developed countries have the, the most students with the most skills in digital skills. And developing countries like Mexico, for example, not many students have these digital skills, especially in public education. In public education in Mexico, for example, uh, in elementary schools, they don't even have um, computers at the schools. They don't even have uh, internet at the school. So that's why, that's why in Mexico, the digital device is, is growing more and more. <clears throat> so here are five factors that contribute, contribute to digital divide. Okay? Digital divide is, is, is affected by economy, by social, by geography, by fear of technology, lack of motivation, and cultural. Lack of motivation may, maybe some people don't like technology, some people are reluctant to use technology. And that's why it, it also increases the digital divide in the country, at least in Mexico, that is what's ha happening. Cultural, maybe, maybe some people, depending on their, on their beliefs, they like to use or they won't like to use uh, uh, digital, uh, digital devices in Mexico, okay? Okay. Here's yes, economic. Economic plays a significant role in the digital divide by affecting the affordability of technology, access to resources, availability of skills training, job opportunities, and entrepreneurship. Addressing economic disparities is crucial for bridging the digital divide and promoting inclusive digital participation. Here in Mexico, here in Mexico, there have been many federal programs that are trying to establish a way to solve this, okay? How? Programs that provide, for example, um, six years ago, there was a, a program that uh, provided uh, laptops, that provided uh, tablets to, to the students in Mexico, in ele elementary school. However, this program was only for six years. I, it wasn't possible to, to deliver tablets uh, to all the schools, but, but there was kind of a way to solve it, okay? Social. Social and cultural norms, societal and cultural factors can influence the adoption and utilization of digital technologies. Social exclusion and imagination. Certain groups within society, such as marginalized communities, racial or any minorities, elderly individuals and people with disabilities are more likely to experience exclusion from digital devices. This is an, an important <clears throat> problem because of digital devices. Okay? Social exclusion and marginalization. Social exclusion, here refers to, to the lack of access to technology, to training, and to internet. And this, this problem, as I said before, affects strongly, according to my research, to different countries. Also, geography. Geography factors such as infrastructure limitations, unequal distribution of resources, physical barriers, and vulnerability 
to disasters impact access to digital technologies. Remote or rural areas, as well as developing countries, often face challenges in establishing reliable internet connectivity and bridging the digital divide. This is important. For example, <clears throat> here in Mexico, there are some <clears throat> areas in which, um, which are so far away from, from big cities, okay? And it's also difficult, okay, to take the internet there, or maybe it's too expensive to take internet or devices there. Even, even um, government, several uh, presidents in Mexico have tried to solve this. So far, so far, rural areas in Mexico are not connected to internet. Here, field of technology. This can contribute to a digital divide because individuals who are apprehensive or resistant towards using digital technologies may choose to avoid or limit their engagement with them. This field can stem from concerns about privacy, security, job displacement, or lack of familiarity with technology. This is another variable for the digital divide. Some people are afraid of technology. For example, in my experience, especially elder people, older people yes, are afraid of using technology. Why? Because as I mentioned here, for security, okay? Or maybe for not knowing how to use several apps in, in the device. Lack of motivation. This can be cause for the, of the digital divide because individuals who lack the motivation to engage with digital technologies may not make efforts to acquire the necessary skills or seek out opportunities for digital inclusion. For example, many students in Mexico believe that only when using or for, for using um, Facebook or Twitter, that is an important um, knowledge they can have in order to use technology. Technology is not only that, but it's also, it is also, okay, how to do, for example, projects, how to share information, how to navigate secure in internet. Okay. Culture, cultural beliefs and attitudes towards technology can shape individual perceptions and behaviors regarding digital technologies, leading to disparities in technology adoption. Limited availability for, of content and services in different languages can exclude individuals who don't speak or only as dominant languages, deepen, deepening the digital divide. This is also important, it, it happens in Mexico. Many, for example, speaking about public education in Mexico, not many students have English classes. So much of the content that we can find on internet is in English. So students, students obviously won't use those pages, won't navigate those apps. Why? Because they don't speak the language, okay? So here I go with five consequences of digital divide, okay? Number one is education, educational inequality. Obviously, obviously, private education has better opportunities than public education, at least in Mexico, okay? And obviously, uh, public education have to fight, okay, in order to get devices, in order to get internet for their students. As long as private education, no, okay, they, they already have that. Economic disparities, obviously, obviously. <clears throat> Imagine a student who graduates from a public school in Mexico, we have less skills, less job opportunities, rather than or, or compared with a student who graduates from a public, from a private school, okay? Here, social exclusion, obviously, obviously, because for example, if students or people don't use internet, okay, don't use, for example, social, social sites, they are going to be excluded from information shared, for example, on different sites like Facebook, like Twitter, okay? And they, they will know what is happening in the, digital, in the digital world. They will only know what is happening in the real world, but they won't get that information okay, from the digital world. That is why I call here social exclusion. <clears throat> Hell is by this. Obviously, I mean, for example, in the pandemic here in Mexico, many people had to get uh, uh, the uh, medical appointments okay, uh, through internet. But imagine, imagine here in Mexico, the, the percentage of people who have uh, access to internet, uh, according to statistics, is around 70%. The, the other 30%, okay, they don't have access to internet. Also, imagine trying to get a medical appointment on, on internet if you don't have the, the device and you don't have uh, the, the resources to do that. Okay, that is why I wrote here health disparities. 
he had reduced civic engagement, obviously, obviously, because uh, obviously on social sites, okay, you can also learn about civics, okay, civic events, okay, our, our, our organizations about uh, sponsoring uh, civil actions in, in, in Mexico, political actions, okay, and if you don't have connectivity, you won't know, unless, unless it is published on, on its papers. Here in Mexico, many, many people, for example, especially elder people, prefer to read the newspaper in paper, not in digital. So here I wrote a, a graphic, okay, which is, for example, let me move this, okay. Mobile devices put, uh, put the worldwide in WWW. So number one is India, and, and then it goes to Indonesia, look at this in, in Mexico, and so on to different countries, okay. It says a uh, number of internet users who only use mobile devices to access the internet. Okay. Yeah. I would say, where in the world is the internet most free? Okay. For example, here we have from Estonia to Australia, and we have from Cuba, which is down, okay, to China, which is more controlled than uh, the access to internet. This is also. Is also violating okay uh, uh, the users' rights okay to free internet to free access to internet okay some government solutions for example in my research case I found that they can solve this problem thanks to infrastructure development subsidized internet access digital skills training device provision community digital centers and public and private partnerships for example here in, here in Mexico. Many companies, many private companies have tried to do this, okay? Subsidize internet access to schools. However, they are small companies yet. They have to grow more in order to cover all, all the country. Digital skills training, for example, in Microsoft and, and Google, they have several courses, okay, in order to help students and to help teachers to develop their digital skills for free, okay? <clears throat> So here I'm going to speak about Microsoft and, and Google about what solutions they have for digital divide, okay? For example, <clears throat> for Microsoft, okay, there are several apps which can work online and offline. For example, Microsoft Word, Microsoft Excel, Microsoft PowerPoint, OneNote, and Outlook. Obviously, obviously, the teacher needs to have access to internet. Upload activity, Okay, or upload um, homework okay, on any of these apps. And then students, whenever they have access to internet, they can um, access the file okay, and they can read the homework and they can do the homework. Obviously they can download, they can download the activity from any of them. And whenever they have internet, they, ha they can upload or they can uh, refresh the activity on in the cloud, okay? For example, how much internet do, does a student need, for example, to, to, to access these files and to download activity? No more, for example, for a Word, Excel, PowerPoint, and OneNote, and Outlook, maybe, maybe an, an, a device on, or, or a tablet, maybe, for example, it will spend for a student three or four megas, okay, just downloading. And then a student can do the activity, okay, at home or in any computer, okay, and then in order to upload other three or four megas, okay? This is a solution that Microsoft found, okay? The same happens with Google, okay? Google has several devices, okay? Has several apps, which I'm sure you know, which is Google Docs, Google Sheets, Google Slides, and Google Keep. It happens the same, okay? The teacher can upload activity, the students, whenever they can, they can download activity, and after that, after that, students can also upload and, and and share the activity in the cloud, okay? Okay, so listen. Microsoft has several programs, okay, for teachers, okay? And, and several programs for students, okay? The first one is, is Microsoft School Incubator, Microsoft Showcase School, that is for schools, okay? So maybe in your institution, it doesn't mean that you, you have access to internet all the time. It's just only needed to have access to internet from time to time, okay? Microsoft Excel School Incubator is, is the first step to have a certified school with Microsoft. What are the benefits as a, as a school? Obviously, if you, your school achieves to have or to be Microsoft School Incubator or Microsoft Showcase School, 
your school we have um, low prices for tablets, low prices for laptops. Uh, your school will be invited to participate in, in conferences like this one, okay, around the world, maybe virtual or maybe face to face. And your school will be invited to share your experience and to learn from other schools in your same um, settings, in your same environments, in, in your same um, economical situations. How, how schools have achieved to implement technology? There is a program for teachers, which is called Microsoft Innovative Educator Experts. This is a certification for teachers that, that are eager or who want to learn about technology. All of these trainings for my, for my experts, that is an my experts, is free. Or once again, it doesn't mean that a teacher needs to have access to internet all the time. For example, maybe you as a teacher, you, you, you have a, a free hour, okay? And, in a day or, or you know, two, twice a week. It doesn't matter, you can connect to the internet, take the course, okay? And at the end of each course, you will get a certification. You will get a free certification for Microsoft. Obviously, Microsoft knows that digital divide can affect you. And obviously, Microsoft knows and that you can, you will be solving this situation whenever you can. So what I, I want to say is that Microsoft is not really strict in using technology all of the time. They know, they know that some schools, some countries, okay, I like for example in Mexico, they don't have access to internet all the time. For example, let me tell you my experience. I have worked for a school which is called um, UPAP, that is in, in the state of Mexico, here in Mexico. That school is located in, in a rural area with students who are really, really, really poor, okay, and the school doesn't have access to internet all the time. It has access to internet three times a week. So in those three, three days, they can work on all of this. The students can share information. Teachers can, can take their courses, okay? And right now, that school with, that school with the lack of internet, with uh, not many devices, okay? The students have to share their devices, two students with one device, okay? Right now, this school is here in a Microsoft Jockey School. As I said previously, the first step is this one, Microsoft School Incubator, and then your school can move to Microsoft Jockey School. This is a way in which Microsoft has tried to, to, to leverage okay, the, the possibilities for digital device. Okay, here I wrote the bibliography, and also, also you will find a, a research paper that, that I go out here for digital divide. You can, you can access to PPDCI, okay? And everybody will be able to download it and to read, okay? Basically, basically it's, it's my research on digital divide, okay? Generally in the world, and then I focus it in, in Mexico, okay? Okay, I don't know if you have any, any questions. From, from the Miguel, chat, I, I couldn't find any questions in the chat room. All right, or any, any, any comment. Uh, I, I would like one of one of the teachers to come right there, okay, and tell me, please, uh, what is the situation in Pakistan? Is it the same as in Mexico? Is it different? I don't mean you can comment that on, 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 on the chat. Miguel, can you please repeat the question? Ah, uh, yes. Can you please share some your information, okay, your experience as what is happening in Pakistan? Is it happening the same as in Mexico? Here in Mexico, digital divide is really is a really strong problem right now. Okay, I think, I think no, no questions. Okay. So we have thank yous in the chat room, but not the answer to the question which you have just asked them. Oh, in case I get it, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be collating and sharing with you. Very good. So thank you very much. Okay. If you want my presentation, you can ask it to PPDC, to Hina. Okay. And obviously, I really advise you okay, to, to read the research paper, which is really informative and it will give you a clear idea of what's happening in Mexico. Okay. <clears throat>
Thank you very much, Miguel. If you stop sharing, so I'll share the screen and present your certificate of recognition. Very good. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Hina. Thanks thank a lot. Thank you very and much. Thank you, thank you to very the PDC, much. okay, for the opportunity. The certificate thank says in recognition of his unwavering commitment, exceptional leadership, and valuable contributions, we extend our heartfelt appreciation to him for the dedication and efforts which have significantly enhanced our organization and positively impacted teaching fraternity, our team, and the goals we have accomplished together. So thank you very much, Mr. No, thank Miguel. you. Thank you for your participation, so. contribution, advices, and suggestions for the growth of PPDCI and the growth of teaching fraternity. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So ladies and gentlemen, with this, we are moving on in the roller coaster of learning. And the next presenter is going to talk about a very important area that is achievement gap, which is here in Pakistan, which is there around the globe, which is everywhere. So Janet, welcome on board. And let me tell you about Janet. She is English teacher with 17 years of experience in the state of Kohelia. She is owner and principal of My English Place English Academy in Francisco, Madero. She is teacher, trainer, and public speaker. She is president of Max T. Saw Laguna chapter and active member of several teachers, chambers, and associations. She is passionate, active, and worried about improving her teaching skills in order to have successful learners. She is a member of ICLT and OIC, rather a very active member of both the platforms. So thank you very much for joining us today, Ms. Janeth. Over to you now. Thank you, Gina. Thank you so much. Welcome. Good uh, morning in Mexico. Good afternoon in Pakistan. Okay. Um, I will share, I will start sharing my presentation. Just give me a sec here. I would like this to be an interactive uh, presentation. So the first thing I will ask you is to participate actively with me, okay? And the first thing I, we're going to have is this uh, Gina already uh, presented me. I am Janet Ortiz, okay? And I will tell you two things about two true things about me and two sorry, and one lie about me. Yes, I'm Janet Ortiz. I'm a mother of three children. I work in a library and I'm an English teacher. Which of the three things I said about me that you think is a lie? You don't work in a library. That's a lie. Thank you. Yeah, that's a lie. I don't work in a library. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. So I don't know, Gina, if uh, they can, well, three people can interact with the audio. That would be very difficult, but if you really think it's mandatory, we can name someone and they can participate because it's a large group. So nominating someone will become a little tough for us. But okay, if it is... so, okay, so would you recommend just in the chat? Okay, let's carry it on in chat, yeah. Okay, let's, uh, okay, three people, please write in the chat your name, two things about you and one lie about you and let me guess. Allow me to moderate this. So Maria Bhutto and uh, Alia Ali Bhutto, Amber Bhatti, and Bisma Latif and Caroline, I would like you to write about yourself in the chat room and then others will start guessing. Ethel has also written. <laughs> Ethel said already, I'm not sleeping at Mexico's time. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, I'm thankful to people who are joining us from Mexico, but this is really dawn time there. Uh, the Mary, good, I'm a good singer, my good joker. Uh, let me try to guess. One more thing about you, Maria. Uh, let me guess, let me guess. You're not a good joker. That's a lie. Hey, I guess. <laughs> Excellent. Who else? Who else? Come on. Thank you, Maria. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Bisma says, um, a good listener. 
Okay, but just one thing, Wisma, for those, for those mentor, three children, 20 years, I realize you, you have three children. For those. Oh my goodness, I'm, uh, that you are 20 years old, Kathy? Are those? Yeah, thank you. So you're not 20. Kilash, I'm a student and tailor master. Um, that your student is alive. Shifa, I'm intelligent, honest in my students, layer and merit. Okay, excellent. I'm a merit either. Okay. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much. And let's get started with this uh, presentation. And my topic is the achievement gap. Okay, and uh, especially in English learning. First of all, first of all, I will show you this. What's the achievement gap? Okay, we talk about the achievement gap with it is a disparity in academic performance between groups or communities of students okay it could be in different communities and different countries or in different social contexts in and in the they present this disparity this uh, inequality in the academic performance that means some learn more than others, some uh, reach a higher level than others. It actually really shows up in the standardized test, score, test scores, dropout rates, college access opportunities, and among others. What does that mean? Uh, that we don't find out until this, the scores or the grades in the standardized test are pre down or, or when they don't have access to the schools because their grades are not very good, even though they might seem to have the abilities, okay? And which are some, which are some characteristics of the achievement gap? I will tell you this. Let me just do this, okay? Which are some characteristics of the achievement gap? Well, first of all, it can be present in all levels of areas of, the, of, of education. That means it could be with children, with teenagers, with adults, and it can be in private schools or in public schools, in small countries or in big countries, it doesn't matter. It has a negative impact in society since learners can miss the good career opportunity because of this situation. Uh, the students reach a different level of achievement and they might present lack of interest in keeping starting a career or even a lower grade of school. Um, it can be discouraging also for learners. Oh, excuse me. Okay who are more bound to experience the achievement gap? First of all, students with unprivileged economical status, that means uh, people from, it could be in the same country, but with a different uh, economical situation, right? The students with disabilities also, uh, racial and ethnic min minorities that may not have the same access, and opportunities to learn the language and others in English language learning in different countries and social contexts. Here, we're going to learn how to identify and help uh, to close the achievement gap. Why is it important to identify and help close the achievement gap? Because uh, as teachers, we, have a, a, a high expectancy. Well, people have a high expectancy about us. And the first thing they think about us when you have a, a group of students is they have to learn. You have to teach them. You have to teach them, okay? And what happens if, if they don't learn enough or they don't uh, reach 
the scale that they expected to. Well, they might say that you're not uh, doing a good job. Yeah, that's why it's, uh, it's true that the responsibility for teaching is not just on the uh, teacher, but also on the learner and also on the parents and also in the environment. But uh, we have a very important role in it. That's why it's very important that we learn how to do this in order to achieve our goals. The first thing we uh, should do is to create a method, focus on a whole individual. We must understand that we don't have just students. We don't have just learners. We have people in our classrooms, okay? And since they are individuals, well, they have feelings, emotions, desires, uh, fears. They are facing different situations. They have needs, special needs uh, for learning and for doing things and for not doing things. Yeah, you, you must uh, focus on the whole individual in order to know why that person is there. If you're working in a if you're working in a public school, you don't have any other chance, but teach the subject, even if the learner is not looking for it. Maybe the learner is not there to learn English, is there to learn other things, but he or she is not interested in learning the language. Nevertheless. If you find something interesting about the student's needs, for example, that they want to travel abroad, you might find a motivation there for, for that person, for that student, yeah? For example, maybe you work in a private school and you ask a student, hey, what's your interest in learning English? And they'd say, they say, that they want to get a good job or a better job than the one they have now, that's a good chance for them, okay? Uh, for you, sorry, to, to work and explode the student's motivation, intrinsic motivation that they already has. So that's why you must create a major focus on the whole individual. One tip, at the beginning of your course, always ask students what they expect uh, about your course or, or what they are looking for by joining your course, okay? After that, you must always be aware of your attendance. It's important to check the attendance every day, not just because the school in which you work asks you, asks you to do it, but also to know What's going on with your students that don't attend school? There are two, um, two parts, two phases. Yeah. The first, the student who always attends the class and who always is there very early, even before you join the class, and stays always participating. The student who always goes to your class, always attends your class, but, but who always, uh, who never participates. Nevertheless, he or she stays there all the time. And also the student who, the day that attends your class is there attending your class, taking notes, asking questions, participating, raising the hand, giving opinions, sharing, but suddenly he or she disappears for three, four days of the week and you don't understand why but you enjoy him or her bringing back uh, idea, ideas to the classroom so that's why you must always be aware of the, your attendance in that way you will identify the problems that the students are facing also try to find out about your students social emotional learning why is that important? Because as I told you before, as I told you before, you don't work with just learners. You work with people, okay? You work with people. And as well as we work with people, people have emotions, some good emotions, some not very comfortable emotions. I won't say they are bad or good because emotions are neutral 
I can be sad for something good. I can cry for something good. I can be happy for something bad. So that's the matter of uh, managing emotions, but you must be aware of your students' emotion. Why? Because in that way you can appeal to those emotions to explore learning. Or if you can uh, find a mode that you can find a way to join to sorry to teach something good for your student or something useful for your student by learning about their emotion uh, emotion uh, in that moment. This is truly truly very important. Make a conscious analysis of your national assessment educational system. Most of the times, teachers who work for an institution, uh, especially when it is a, a government institution, we just follow a syllabus. We just follow a path that they indicate us to, to have, right? But we don't actually, we don't actually care about the usefulness that system has or how this system can impact on our students. So it's very important. Most of the times we cannot change it, but we can give opinions about it. If we are close to uh, the people who make all this system, right? But if you cannot, at least in an internal way, you can do something with your students. So make a Janet, you are muted mistakenly. Can you please unmute yourself? Yeah, perfect no. now. I don't know why I I wasn't muted, sorry. Okay, so as I was telling you, make a conscious analysis of the national assessment educational system. Maybe you cannot change it, or most probably you cannot change it because it's all a whole system that you're in right but in an internal way close to your learners you can do something different so that they can reach the expectations that they have from our students or from you as a teacher yeah this is another uh, strategy go deeper into your students needs to improve your teaching approach check the difference between this one and this one this is social emotional learning appeal to their emotions social needs emotional needs in order to give them something useful for them this one is try to find your your students needs so that you can improve yourself your teaching approach in that way it doesn't matter if you have been teaching for seven years 10 years 15 years 17 years you will always learn something different generations of students are changing continuously so Every generation is new. Every generation will teach you something new, a new way of teaching every time. So once that you ask your students what they need or they expect from your class, it will help you find different ways to teach and improve the results. Here I will present some tips. Yeah. And these tips are kind of attached or kind of tied to uh, the tips that I found before that I told you before. First of all, once that you have focus on your students' needs, once that you are aware of their attendance, if they are attending the class continuously or not, if they uh, attend your class, but they are not paying attention or they are not enjoying the class. If you, sorry, if they feel happy about your class or if they feel anxious about your class, 
or if they feel afraid of your class. Anyhow, you should create a culture of recognition to all of the students you have in your class. Even the student who almost never shares something appropriate to the class or something expected by you in the class has something to be recognizable. So that's why it's important to prize the student with the best grades, the student who participates a lot, the student who is always in your class, the student who hasn't been in your class, but today he or she is here participating. Prize the student who always gets everything incorrect, but today he got something right. Let him or her know that he can manage, that he can do it as well as the rest. Yeah. Uh, recognize a student who, even though lives far away from the school, is there with you in the class. Everything good, everything nice you find in the students, by minimal, by minimal part that it could represent, please recognize it to students. Second, always encourage your learners to be better, but not better, not better than the rest of the students that you have in the classroom. Better, a better version of themselves each time, little by little. Don't force them, just push them a little. Encourage them by telling them, Yes, I you you see you can do it. Hey, that was very good. Wow, how good response you gave me today. Hey, this exercise was very good this time. I know tomorrow it will be better. Yeah, things like that. So in that way, students will know that they can do it and that they can do it better the next day and the next day and the next day until they master the goals you establish for the class. Number three, look after your students' emotional status. We're not psychologists. Well, maybe some teachers are, but not all of us. Yeah, so certainly we cannot get completely involved in their lives. But if you look after their students, your students' emotional status in a moment, and you find a small reason uh, of their sadness or happiness, you can transform this feeling in a positive way for learning. So every time uh, that is possible to you, document yourself about a nonverbal language. Yes, study their faces. That's the way they see, the way they see it, the way they participate, the in intonation uh, in, in which they speak, the posture they have when they say something to you in the class. In that way, you can find a little or much of their emotional status. Number four, create an effective filter the students, well, learners will always feel uh, feel like learning something new if they feel tied to you emotionally, if they feel you love them, and if they feel they love you, everything will work better. Next, manage motivation all that time. You need to focus on a student's motivation Intrinsic and extrinsic. Why are they in your class? Because they, they need and really want to learn English for a, a better job or for meeting someone abroad or for getting married with an American guy or whatever. Or maybe they are in your class because there is no other way. They have to be there because it's part of the program in the school. So you have to find the reasons why they are there so that you can manage 
that motivation. If they don't have motivation, you have to find something that motivates the learner to learn. Next, make public recognition activities. Public recognition. There is a saying in Mexico that it says that if you want to uh, punish someone or give indications or criticize someone, do it in private. But if you want to recognize or prize someone, do it in public, do it publicly. So it's very important that when you tell your student, hey, very good, you're a great student, do it publicly. Give a diploma, give a medal, give a candy, even a candy will do. So that your student, so that the learner feels really, really loved, motivated, and encouraged to be better each time, little by little, in your course. Awards and rewards. Awards, diplomas, letters, certi uh, certificates, and everything you can imagine. I will tell you an example. I have a I have a group in which I have a I have students which are about to finish the career, so they are in the last semester and they sometimes are like uh, not feeling very well to to go or to enter English class because they feel they haven't learned enough since or since they started the career. Nevertheless, in every class when they when I ask them. Uh, to give a presentation or to make a sketch or something, I always design little little uh, posts or little flyers in Canva or in PowerPoint and show them. Hey, that was very good. Look, hey, first place. Hey, a first the very first student of today. Or hey, you are great, and tomorrow you will be even greater. Things like that, and then they feel they got an hour and recognition and they and that motivates them to participate more. Rewards. If there is no candy, if there is no money, there are always extra points in your, if in your system. It is permitted, you are allowed to give extra points for every time they do something good. And in that way, they will be participating all the time because they want a good grade in your class. And well, before I finish, I will have to ask you some, I, I would like to ask you something, and it is this. Please, in your chat, I need you to, to write this. How do you feel with this information? Where your expectancies about this stuff achieved? And how will this influence your impact your teaching from now on? Can you please participate in the chat? How did you find this information? How did you feel with this information? And tell me, were your expectancies about this talk achieved? And how will this influence or impact your teaching from now on? I will be more vigilant towards my students' social well-being. Thank you, Amber, thank you. Wales, information you share really effective and proactive. Thank you so much. That talk was very interesting, Mariam. Thank you. Please, I feel that this is informative. Thank you so much. At any time, we should incorporate my methodology into my teaching as well. Thank you, Sid Davina. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. That's the goal. Yeah, finally, that's the goal that as teachers share this knowledge and these experiences so that we can improve our teaching. Thank you very much. So I will 
uh, share my contact information with you. This is my email. And in that uh, QR, you can find my information. It is so that you can contact me at any time you need something, you need questions, you need assessment or tutoring. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank so, you so very much, Janet. And the chat room is full of the appreciation and gratitude for the way you presented today. And you opened up a new realm for all the participants. Thank you so very much. And I also understood from your talk that we teachers have got a medas touch. And brick by brick, block by block, we can change the lives of our learners. So thank, thank you so, so very much. much. Allow me to present this uh, membership card and the certificate to you, Janet. You are our international presenter. Thank you so very much for your participation. Thank and uh, you. we really honor your contribution. And because of you, we are growing and we are going higher and we are meeting the bar and we are coming at the bar. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, here we say thank you to Ms. Janet. And uh, let me take you to a brief journey how we have been through PPDCI's journey throughout the you know, tenure. This one year was not actually one year. It was a long effort at the back. And I could still remember the very initial days when we started. So today, when I speak before you, this is my immense joy and gratitude as we celebrate a significant milestone, the anniversary of our organization's commitment to education and community service. Today, we reflect on the journey that has led us to this moment, and we are reminded of the profound impact our organization has had on the lives of countless individuals within our community each day. And we have worked tirelessly to break down the barriers, ignite hope, and create transformative opportunities throughout the education. And today, we celebrate this anniversary. We acknowledge the challenges we have faced along the way, and these all giants have been with us in facing the challenges. We recognize the persistence required to navigate the ever-evolving educational landscape and the commitment needed to adapt and uh, innovate. But in the face of adversity, we have remained steadfast in our belief that education is a fundamental right, not a privilege. And uh, the very, you know, the very individual who has joined and touched PPDCI, regardless of their background or circumstances, they have been through excellence. And I'm really happy and looking ahead that this anniversary is going to be a catalyst for renewed inspiration and ambition. Let us recommit ourselves to the core values that define our organization's compassion, equity, collaboration, and community engagement. And let me take you to the tour, how, how far we have come so far. Let me take you that tour. That's very important for you and for me to know what we had been doing and how the things have been coming to our way. For that matter, I'll be sharing my screen once again. And I'll show you this detail. In one year, we have been conducting a lot of events and the list goes here. We have conducted two boot camps so far. They spend around 18 days and involve 36 presenters from around the globe. Three conferences spanning over 14 hours and involve 13 presenters from different countries. Then we had a lot of monthly coachings, the workshops and the webinars on a monthly basis for the community service reason. So far, we have trained within no time 4,340 people. And we have been catering the global audience, which was catered. And now constantly, we are increasing the cycle of influence, alhamdulillah. So far, we have collaborated with 38 countries and much more to come. Inshallah, we are planning to have members from around the globe. And very soon, this organization is going to lead from the front, inshallah. A long way to go for PPDCI. Happy anniversary once again, everybody. So now we move on to Ms. Gina. And Ms. Gina have been associated with PPDCI for very long. Ms. Gina's profile is something which is really very productive and long to go. And I would like to read from my notes for Ms. Gina. She is an applied linguist translator and English teacher. For the past eight years, she has worked with both children and adults in the educational process, specializing in business English, conversational English, pronunciation, and creative writing. She's also a voice actress and has worked with HBO, Cartoon Network, and several institutions in Mexico and the USA. Her volunteer work as a coordinator in educational center 
is with Sofia Mexico that has her channel and her desire to grow. And she also has people in growing in theater, public speaking, and learning the philosophy of life. So Ms. Zina, the stage belongs to you. And I'm really very grateful that you are up. And ladies and gentlemen, Gina will allow me to share. She's going to have a very special event in her life right after a week from now. But then too, she's sparing her time for us. And here she is early in the morning of Mexico. So Gina, over to you now. Thank you very much, Ms. Hina, for that lovely introduction. I am so grateful and so honored to be back here at PPDCI for your first year anniversary. Uh, congratulations to all of you who have made this happen. And today we, uh, we're going to be looking at some things that I believe are very relevant for, uh, for gen education in general, especially for the people who are gathered here today. Um, can you see my screen? Is my screen yes, visible? Yes, yes, yeah, it's right. visible. Excellent. Thank you. Well, today I wanted to uh, talk about socioeconomic disparities in education, something that, uh, something a little bit of a pain for everyone, uh, but that is relevant for many of the people who join us from all of the countries um, uh, here. We have people from Pakistan, we have people from uh, Latin America, and uh, throughout some months, I've been able also to give some chats on education to people from Ghana, um, Philippines, and many countries which have socioeconomic difficulties. Historically, socially, politically, uh, we are all uh, gathered here by education and our concern as teachers to education, but also we have some things in common that is uh, that in some cases we have been historically and socially disadvantaged in education compared to other countries, which is why education is such a concern for us. Uh, fortunately, most of us, I believe, have been receiving education and some of us have higher education in our countries, in other countries. And this chat is not meant to discourage us, but to help us understand the barriers that we are facing as a global entity and the things that as Ms. Hina was saying at the beginning, no, we have to sort them, we have to face them. But in order to work around all of these uh, barriers, we need to understand them first. So the um, objective for today is to describe the impact of socioeconomic status on educational opportunities and outcomes and explore ways to provide equal access to quality education for students from disadvantaged backgrounds. Backgrounds. Wow. Okay, that's like huge. No, <laughs> it's a huge objective for a 20 minute talk. So uh, basically what we want to do, the first thing that I want to do is to break down all of these big words, right? So I've highlighted what is socioeconomic status? What are educational opportunities? What is quality education? All of these words that we usually hear uh, probably in politics, in economics, in um, in education, even it's interesting, yes, to be able to um, to little by little understand what all of this is and how do we relate uh, education to all of this? Why is money society important in terms of education and what can we do about it? Because sometimes we get far away, we try to distance ourselves from those kind of topics because they're too difficult for us to understand or we feel that they're very foreign to us or that they don't really matter for us as teachers. But let's take a look at what they are. So let's start with the first big word. What is socioeconomic status? What is it? Well, um, normally when we when we hear about socioeconomic status or SES, what we what we think about is a little bit of social class. Social class is something that is a little bit easier for us to understand. We understand as a basic, yes, that uh, social class is the way that a society is divided, but in terms of money, 
right? So we have normally sociologists diverge into how many classes a society can divide into. We, divide, we can divide society into lower class, middle class, upper class. Some sociologists divided it and not to three classes, but maybe five. It really depends on the country. However, what seems to repeat itself is that lower classes um, are normally most of the population and they tend to have less wealth than the upper classes who are a very limited amount of people, right, that has most of the wealth. So that is something that for us is pretty obvious and that we understand. Then we also have social stratification, which means that uh, depending on the social class, people have different jobs and different professions. And uh, we have in the elite, the upper class, we tend to uh, associate it with bankers, with politicians, governments, um, lawyers, engineers, middle class. Yay, there we are, teachers, <laughs> teachers, nurses, and people that work in public service and things like that. And then we have the working class or even the precarious class. And what's interesting about this is that... Um, we tend to associate money with work, right? So if you're going to work on this, you're going to earn this. And um, we tend to, uh, you know, like link social class with social stratification. And uh, that wasn't always like that, right? Um, we, we tend to associate social class with social stratification, but the idea that our, uh, our amount of money tends to define who we are as a person is something that became relevant about 200 years ago. And what is interesting for us as educators is that what we tend to relate is that the higher the social class that we have is the more opportunity for education that we have. Here is some information about that. So here we have some information that um, when people tend to have a higher socioeconomic status, they tend to receive more education. They tend to have a higher degree, a bachelor's degree. And when a person belongs to a lower socioeconomic um, status, they have a less, uh, less education or less school completion. Mm -hmm. And that is something that tends to repeat in many, many societies. In countries like Pakistan uh, and most countries in the Middle East and Latin America, that is especially true for us in the sense that uh, we, all of, the, all of these countries, stand out as the world's most unequal regions where the top classes have most of the income Yes, they have about half of the income of the country and the rest of the population tends to have all the income. So basically, we know that the rich are very, very, very rich and the poor are very, very, very poor in all of these countries, Latin America, Middle East and Africa. And we also know that the children's social class is one of the most significant predictors of their educational success. Mm -hmm. So. Um, this is uh, this is related to education in the sense that when we have a low educational achievement, when we receive a lower education, we have lower economic prospects in life, which is why education in a lot of uh, areas is promoted. So people from lower socioeconomic status tend to promote education in order to gain social mobility. Social mobility means that we want to go from one social level to the next social level. And life is hard, right? Life is usually very hard. And how do we, how can we gain social mobility through education? That is why a lot of people tend to invest in their children's education, learn English, go to private school, go to university, not only for the sake of education itself, not only to learn more, but also to receive more earnings, okay, to go beyond the poverty line, to gain more money, to have a better 
quality of life, to have better life expectations. And we normally tend to associate that, okay, so basically, if I am in a lower socioeconomic level, and I want to go to a higher socioeconomic level, what I need is money, or an education that has received money. It's, it's not enough that I go to public school. I am going to go to private school or I'm going to send my children to private school because private school has money and money is going to get my children to where I want them to be. And that is a very simple way to associate that um, a school with money will give me a better opportunity of life. And that is basically how many people observe this, right? However, socioeconomic status is not as easy as that. According to the American Psychological Association, socioeconomic status is, yes, the position of a person in society, but it's determined by a combination of factors, economic, social factors that are, yes, income, how, many, how much money we receive a month, but also the type of education, the amount of education, the prestige of the occupation, the place of residence, and sometimes even ethnic and religious background matters. Okay, so it's something that is more complicated than just money, education. The, the more money that you get, the more education and the better education that you get. Something a little bit more complicated than that. Why? Because uh, socioeconomic status affects all levels of society and affects all aspects of teaching. So I want to tell you very quick uh, an experiment that I did, uh, well, no, a research that I did when I was studying my master's in the University of Birmingham. Uh, we did a qualitative study with 12 men and women that were ELT, that means English language teachers in Mexico City. Uh, that This was around the year 2019. So what basically I did was I interviewed teachers that were from different socioeconomic status, meaning that I interviewed people from public and private uh, schools. And in this, um, in this environment, what I wanted to see was some of the effects that social aspects, that social context had on the teachers the effects on their emotional health, on their mental health, on their identity. And we found some very interesting results. So the socioeconomical factors that were taken into consideration were the teaching programs of the English teachers, their training, the school budget, uh, and then the parents' expectations and the roles that the owners of schools and principals had. So all of these are socioeconomical factors that went into the research that we're taking into consideration for both public and private schools. And what we found was that there was a big conflict for all the teachers, not only for the lower um, socioeconomic uh, level teachers in their beliefs, their values, their motivation, their mental health, their emotional health. Everybody had uh, conflicts. Yeah, so we had an impact of socioeconomic level on all the teachers. Why? And what kind of effects? So in general, what happened in the disadvantaged environments? We had teachers from public schools. This is a, a, a short interview that we have. And basically, the problems that we had in public schools were the lack of of material, furniture, and um, just general material elements to make things happen. Yes, we have here uh, some, some things that say we don't have the proper furniture or materials that work properly. Uh, I, we don't have speakers, so I have to bring my own. Some time ago we had computers, but they almost immediately broke down. They never came to fix them. There are some children that can't bring their complete material um, that they didn't bring the notebooks, their colored pencils, because they have to choose between that and to buy their lunch at recess. This happens in, in, in Mexico, but I'm sure that some of you can relate to some of your own students where you have, uh, where you have seen this. And that is because of this uh, economic gap that we have in many of our countries. We have something that is called less social mobility, which means that 
what we said, no, the rich are very rich and the poor are very poor. The access to education is very, very um, um, different <laughs> depending on the levels of society. So what we are saying here is that the educational opportunities in lower social class are influenced by what are educational opportunities? Educational opportunities can be seen as the access to learning, meaning that uh, um, a student can actually get to school. Mm -hmm. What are the learning conditions? Do we have a teacher for the day? Do we have um, school material? Do we have benches? Do we have bathrooms that work? Do we have uh, lightning? We have, like uh, teacher Miguel said, do we have technology to actually access our classroom planning? And then how do we um, praise or how do we encourage this learning achievements once all of the learning is done? Do we get at a learning outcome, a social realization of all of these effort? So normally we tend to link this, um, when we have this low opportunities, when we don't have access to learning or learning conditions or learning materials, then the scores of tests and the learning outcomes tend to be lower. And the more opportunity that we have to this, when we have good learning conditions, good learning materials, good access to learning, when scores tend to be higher. Um, and then, so in, uh, in students that have a lower socioeconomic profile have to develop more resilience, okay? Here is a chart of uh, academic resilience, meaning the ability to, uh, to confront different types of problems in life. This is a very... Uh, um, wide scheme, but I, I want us to focus here. One of the biggest things that children from lower socioeconomic level have to focus on is their resilience to their socioeconomic elements. Okay, so they have to do, um, they have to do a big, big effort to confront this. And we would say, yes, of course, if they have to develop resilience to endure this, how are they going to get a good education? How are we going to confront this? But let's go to the other side of the scale, okay? Let's see what kind of problems we had in privileged environments, meaning in private schools. So in privileged environments, the problems that we were facing with students and with teachers was the entitlement of parents and the competitive environment, okay? So here we have parents that feel the power to demand lots of things. It's hard to make parents understand how, uh, how children learn because they learn using different methods. Sometimes parents want to complain, but uh, don't believe that teachers are prepared. So meaning that sometimes in private schools, um, parents feel that because they have money and they are paying for the education of their children, they can actually say what goes and what doesn't go. And that affects the school program, that affects the teacher's mental health, emotional health, because they are demanding a lot of things. And also with highly competitive environments, that affects the student's emotional and social well being. When competition is not an explicit value, but it's something that the school promotes, be the best, be the best, be the best, okay? That is something that also affects, yes, their development. It affects how they do in school because not everybody can keep up with the high level, okay? So teachers don't like so much the competition because it doesn't promote a healthy classroom environment, Okay, as a teacher, uh, teachers suffer because I'd rather, they rather would give, uh, like a teacher Janet was saying, encourage all your students individually, uh, tell them that they did something good every day. However, that is not always possible when you have a competitive environment in the top schools of the country. So basically, um, uh, the educational outcomes that we get from both spectrums of the socioeconomic status can give us 
um, a broader vision that education is not just a uh, given in quality when we are uh, in a better school. Okay, so more money, okay, having money and materials is not enough for quality education. Okay, quality education is not just achieved by being in a school that has the supplies. Okay, private school, yes, will have uh, your resources, will have the materials, but they will have other kinds of problems. Okay, because the socioeconomic background affects the cognitive achievement. Yes, their performance in tests and their performance in other aspects, but also the socio-emotional well-being, the educational attainment. Yes, their sense of belonging to the school, their self-expectations. We all as teachers know how much the feelings of a student can affect, yes, their development, can affect how well they do on tests, how well they are paying or not attention. Okay, so we can't just all blame it on the money. Mm -hmm. We have to consider that the socio-emotional well-being and the cognitive achievement and the educational attainment all come into place to give us quality education. So um, here, for example, this is uh, one, uh, um, one note from one of the teachers that says, you know, last week a girl said that I hurt her. I grabbed her arm too hard and I buried my nails into her. They called me to the principal's office and they asked what happened. And I was like three or four days at the office being questioned until one of the girls admitted the truth. At the end of all this, they didn't apologize to me. I was the one who had to apologize. And there was a moment when I said, well, it's over. Here we're talking about teacher burnout, teacher's depression, students who are not given uh, values, for not understanding the value of a teacher. And could you tell if this was from a private or a public school? It could be both, yes? So this is an aspect that can affect both public education and private education. So there are human aspects of teaching that transcend the curriculum and that transcend the socioeconomic aspects. There are human aspects of education that go across the whole society and that influence it. They influence the environment of the class, the teacher performance, his or her motivation, and the student's performance as well. So basically, it's a multidimensional problem where everything connects to everything, right? And um, this is the first part of uh, our presentation. Yes, so as we have seen, socioeconomic status impacts educational opportunities and outcomes, but in all the spectrum, it's a multidimensional problem. Now, how can we reduce these gaps? How can we make equal access to quality education a thing? Okay, let's take a look at what is this of equal access to education? So basically what we're saying is that there are some people in certain uh, aspects of society who, as, as in this image, we can see have a head start, you know? People from a higher socioeconomic level, uh, we feel that they have this advantage because they have more learning hours, because the school infrastructure is excellent, uh, because they have more learning material and because they have access to learning technology. And the rest of the the rest of the students, the rest of the teachers feel that they are left behind. So maybe equal access to the materials, to the same learning hours and to the same material would help, right? Well, let's take a look at this. If what we feel that we have is inequality because we have unequal access to opportunities, then what we're searching for is equality. So as we can see in this lovely image, we have inequality, which is uh, one girl is receiving, yes, one girl is receiving the apple falling from the tree because it's tended to be uh, linked a little bit lower and the apple falls more, uh, more easily and the other kid doesn't have it. So what would happen if we had an equal opportunity, equal education for everybody? Evenly distributed tools. Now, both kids have a stare. Why is one kid still receiving the apple and the other one isn't? Well, nowadays, 
I would say steps one and steps two are the problem with many perceptions on equality and education. I remember that in my country, in Mexico, about 10 or 15 years ago, there was a president who said, okay, we're going to give computers and tablets to all the children in public schools and the people who can't afford it, the government is going to give out their tablets. So now everyone will have equal access to technology, equal education, equal opportunities. But there was a problem because the people who were in rural environments, the people who received the tablets uh, didn't have uh, electricity in their school. So how were they going to charge their tablets? How were they going to get to this education? So the problem is more complex than that. What we want in education is not equality, but equity and justice. What is equity? Equity is not just giving everyone the same tools, but actually give tools that are customized to the necessities of each student. Mm -hmm. Not every school needs a tablet and not every school needs the same tools than uh, so higher socioeconomic uh, level schools need. Okay, we all know the needs that our students in our schools need to have access to quality education. So what we need, like in this case, in number three, maybe this kid would need a higher ladder to access the apple. We as teachers know what are the needs of our students, the needs of our school. And I am sure that even though we have points in common in Pakistan, in Mexico, in Colombia, in Saudi Arabia, in Ghana, in all of the countries that you're joining us from, we have points in common, yes, but we all have our unique special needs. And being in an equity environment, having equity in education means that uh, teachers and governments and institutions have to think of tools that are useful for that society or that student or that school in particular. We have to build tools that give us a better access to education, not the same access to everyone, but the access that makes sense for each kind of school, for each kind of student. Mm -hmm. um, and then the ultimate goal, yes, the dream come true would be not to have to build tools to access the system, but to change the system itself. That would be justice, okay? Justice in education would be to actually fix the tree, make it the same to everyone, fixing the system to offer the same opportunities to everything. Instead of building tools, instead of having to say, okay, so this school needs tablets to access technology, but this other school needs first to have electricity, okay? So this would be equity, okay? To give access to electricity to everyone, that would be justice, that everyone had electricity, that all children had access to education. Not, uh, uh, for example, oh, well, okay, let's build tablets that don't need electricity. That would be thinking of a custom made tool for a school that doesn't have internet or doesn't have electricity. That would be building a tool. But why build a tool and not fix the whole system? Okay, why do we have to adjust ourselves to the unfair disadvantages that the society is built in? That's the problem, right? that the whole of society has unequal things as unfair aspects in all of our countries. And once we get to equity, here are some aspects of OECD, that when we gain um, equity aspects in reading, meaning giving uh, equal opportunities to reading, it can improve in a relatively short time. Education can improve. Here we have from different countries around the world, how given access to, um, to reading, to books from 2000 to 2015 had some amazing changes in some countries. So the line here in 2000, for example, in a country, um, in a country like the United Arab Emirates had amazing results to 2015 
in the terms of equity. So better uh, social mobility, greater advancements were made when equitable tools were given, not the same tools for everyone, but when custom made tools were made. Uh -huh. But in some countries, unfortunately, for example, like Peru, they went down. They had less equity, probably because their own circumstances made it more difficult to understand it like this. So what is the dream here? The dream is to have a fair society. And that is what the United Nations dreams for quality education. Learners who are healthy, well nourished, eager to participate. That is quality education. Outcomes that include knowledge, skills, attitudes, and we would say, wow, okay, so if we could have all the learners who are super healthy, well nourished, what would be the 2030 goals for education and transformation around the world? Well, the United Nations wants that for 2030, we have that both boys and girls have access to quality early development, access to affordable uh, vocational education increase the number of people who have relevant skills for employment, eliminate all discrimination in education, ensure universal literacy, ensure education for sustainable development, the building of inclusive and safe schools, the supply of qualified teachers in development countries. And this sounds amazing and lovely and beautiful, but we also have to say, oh my God, okay, be pragmatic. That's, that's not something that we can attain by 2030. Like consider my school and consider my friend's school. How can we make all discrimination in education go away in seven years? Okay, so there's a part of our mind that says that is not possible. Okay, so because what we're trying to do is to go from step one to step four. Instead of crossing from step one to step two to step three to step four. But why is it important to actually have these goals of justice, okay? Because ideals in education are important. I'm going to share with you this phrase that I adore about having an ideal. The reality of society, the reality of exclusion, inequality, repression, violence, and despair is far from ideal. Still, the ideal is there. Not as an unattainable perfection, but to inspire the present, to highlight what we must pay attention to, and to help us locate what stands in the way of making the ideal a reality. An ideal locates the area of interest and concern, points out the characteristics and desired qualities of the landscape, and indicates the characteristics that are an obstacle to the growth of the person and society. The fact that an ideal inspires reality focuses the pending work on reducing the distance between both. So basically, an ideal helps us direct our boat to where it needs to navigate. Even if the reality aspects will not come true in the perceived time. Why? Because don't we teach our students to dream big? Why don't we do that as well? So when we have higher expectations of education at an early age, it is more likely that we will have a skilled employment 10 years later. Okay, so here are some, um, some numbers that when uh, people have higher career expectations at age 15, okay, people in Den Denmark are taught to dream big. The students are taught to dream big in education, and that helps them direct their educational efforts, their educational development. So by the time that they are 25, they have higher expectations of themselves. Okay, we have to be, of course, pragmatic and logical and look at our socioeconomic circumstances, but we also need to dream big, to look at the future, to believe that we can do more. Because looking at that point of reference is going to help us get there more easily than if we just say, well, we're poor. So we're going to have a poor education. And remember, money is not everything, okay? People that have the best school opportunities or the best 
um, the best technology, okay? Don't always receive the best education. What is quality education? Quality education has to do about equity, sustainability, contextualization, a balanced approach, child-friendly teaching and learning, and learning outcomes. Sustainability is just one of the aspects that has to do with the socioeconomic level and equity as well. But all of this, contextualizing our teaching, balancing our approaches, making it a, a child-friendly teaching environment, and having this kind of outcomes, that is something that every school can do if every teacher sets their mind to it. It doesn't have to do with money, all right? So what are some things that our institutions can do to promote quality education? Support disadvantaged children in their education, provide quality programs, yes, develop teachers' capacity to detect students' needs, target additional resources toward disadvantaged students, reduce the concentration of disadvantaged students in particular schools, create a climate that favors learning and well-being, encourage parent-teacher communication, and all of these things, our institutions, our schools, if you are um, school directors, school principals, these are some things that you can do to improve quality education. And thinking uh, that we want to have the best access to everyone in education, what should the governments do? The governments should grant children equal opportunities. They should invest to provide childcare. They should give policies that allow balance, work, and family life. Mm -hmm. So this is the dreaming big part. Okay, so in our own societies, we must demand our authorities that they push this kind of things for education. Uh -huh. Promote, the government has the power to improve social mobilities if these areas are promoted. Mm -hmm. Granting equal opportunities, making policies that balance work and family life. Okay, it's not just enough to say, okay, take a thousand courses of teacher training and that way you will change the world, no. Teachers can change everything. There is a part that is the responsibility of the government. And we shouldn't make all the work, to, we shouldn't give all the work to the teachers because part of the work to improve education comes from governments. And another part of the job comes for institutions. Okay, because if we want to get from step one to step four, from inequality to justice, more things have to change than just me in the classroom. It has to be the whole system that changes. And we must know what are the things that our society needs so that that happens. However, we as teachers, what things can we do in our classroom to give quality education? Well, we can imagine that our own classroom is like a small society. And I reduced it to three things. What is the teacher's job when we talk about quality education? What can we do in the classroom? First, prepare, okay? Studying your content, your lesson plans, prepare your lessons, but not just prepare the class given the curriculum that you have or the study plan that you have. What is it that your students need? Not what comes next week on the lesson plan. What do your students need to learn? Mm -hmm. Do they need to learn about being kind? That may, be, that may be something that will be more useful for them than probably learning the verb to be, if you're an English teacher, for that particular week. Okay, sometimes we do have to think, what is it that our children need? And that relates to point number two. Make your teaching useful. Mm -hmm. Make your, uh, your, your program useful. Regroup in the classroom with workshops, with conversations. Talk to them. Ask them what they think. If you have big things going on on your society, on your city, on your community, ask them how they feel about it. I remember that uh, like five or six years ago when I was with primary students, 
uh, in Mexico, the, the element came for, okay, Trump has become the president of the United States. And the students noticed that their parents were like very tense about this, but they didn't understand why. So I had to stop my classroom for a full 20 minutes to explain a little bit why this was relevant. Sometimes make, giving those kind of comments make learning useful, okay? Students are mentored by teachers. They want to learn about the world. That is what education is about. And the last thing, reflect, okay? With all the insights, you have to, um, we have to think if what we taught them is useful for them and reflect and repeat. So basically, just to finish here, Education is a way to escape poverty and go with more socioeconomic mobility. And quality education is the way to get there. How? With qualified teachers, quality learning, quality resources. Who is responsible for this? Governments, institutions, and teachers. Mm -hmm. Because all that is valuable in human society depends on the opportunity for the individuals, not just for the groups. We have to think of every single person. And we as teachers can do it. We can make it. As Dr. Sue says, the more that you read, the more things you will know. The more you learn, the more places you will go. Thank you very much for your time. Here is my contact information. It was an honor being here today. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much, Gina. It was an absolute pleasure and honor to have you with us at this platform. And you touched upon a very pressing topic, I must say. And yes, if all the children are healthy and well nurtured, what a world that would be. So thank you very much. And uh, we don't have any questions in the chat room. Please allow me to present this membership card and certificate of recognition to you for everything you have been doing for PPDCI since we started a year back. So we present the certificate to you in recognition of your unwavering commitment, exceptional leadership and valuable contributions. So we extend our heartfelt appreciation to her, means to you for the dedication and efforts which have significantly enhanced our organization and positively impacted teaching fraternity around the globe. Our team and the goals we have accomplished together are because of you too. Gina, thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, with this, we move on to our keynote speaker, and the last speaker of the day. After that, we'll proceed with the closure ceremony. But before that, there comes Ethel Campus, my very dear sister. She is the CEO at Hampton School, Mexico, a multilingual teacher and entrepreneur with 24 years of experience in teaching foreign languages, as well as coaching and specialized training for international certifications of different evaluations. With national and international validity and with qualities and strengths such as assertiveness, responsibility, generosity, commitment, creativity, and courage, she's recognized by many as a teacher and directive of excellence and unforgettable quality. She has different degrees on her credits such as technical career as an English teacher, a bachelor's degree in pedagogy and business management a postgraduate degree in curriculum design and a master's degree in senior management that are complemented by various training, updating, and working as academic development courses. Among her all these degrees, she is accredited as a teacher through the teaching knowledge test, TKT, CLIL, and Young Learners for the University of Cambridge, C1 level, Manage of English, and Hebrew validated by the Common European Framework endorsed by the University of Oxford, IELTS exams with grade eight among many other skills. She also has accredited technological skills through Microsoft Education. And what not, Ms. Ethel, she is associated with ICLT, with UNICEF and UNESCO. She has been presented in Mexico on those platforms. And here she is with us today at the platform of PPDCI presenting a very important topic. And that is, over to you, Ethel. Good morning from Mexico, everybody. <laughs> Hi, Gina. What a pleasure to see you again, sister. Thank People, you. I'm so glad to see you over here. This is not the first time for some of you to see me. Janet, Gina, thank you very much, Mike. I don't know if he's still here. It has been a pleasure for me to listen to all of you sharing all that knowledge that you have for everybody. I said in the morning is because I am feeling really tired. Over here, it's morning, 5 p.m., and I say, oh, God, on Sunday, 5, waking up. But it doesn't matter. It's worth it because I am over here with you. And 
the session it's going to be something really beautiful because after all the things that the teachers and the specialists have shared with you my beautiful people to close for me the first thing that i have to say or i had to say was uh hello shalom salute bonjour uh and i guess you say uh um, assalamu alaikum, I guess. I hope I have pronounced correctly for your language. Accurately, Ethel. Thank you. Well, so, because the topic that I have to be talking about is multilingual education. <gasps> Jesus Christ, something that for us teachers sometimes is really difficult to achieve. As some of my partners expressed before, there are many international associations and important ones which are getting worried how the people learn and what are the benefits of sharing knowledge one nation with another. Look at us. This is a good example of how we do it. You speak a, I don't know, maybe Kurdu, Arabian, perhaps you are speaking French, Japanese, German, Chinese, and I speak Spanish. By the way, I forgot to say hola, that is my first language word here. But the, the question over here is what, why, and how are we going to do that? Theory is a lot. I prefer this presentation with something that pulls your attention because I suppose that you're tired after the thing. But let's start knowing what is a multilingual education or better called MLE. It refers to the use or two or more languages as a medium of instruction. I want to start telling you something that is really funny, but that is real. I remember I grew up until three years old when I was in Mexico. And after staying in Mexico three years, I was taken to another country where nobody told me that I had to learn another language, my second mother tongue that is English. I am not the best one, by the way. But I tried to do my best. Suddenly, the necessity obliged me to learn another language, and I found one, the language of my ancestors, Hebrew. And between learning English, Spanish, Hebrew, and writing it, and reading it, and all those things, I got a combination in my mind. And suddenly, I was created this beautiful girl, this Hebrew from languages and nations, who is trying to do exactly the same thing with her students, to teach them what they need in the language they like. It's incredible teachers that sometimes we are English teachers, Spanish teachers, or some other teachers, and the students are only interested about learning French. And I said, I don't like this language. I know that is so tiring, teacher. Why did you teach us French? Teacher, why did you tell us in in Hindi? Why did you tell us in Chinese? And you say, I am an English or Spanish teacher, not Chinese or French teacher. Anyway, we have to learn how to do it, what to do it, how to do it, and what for to do it. In synthesis, all the presentation, you can have it obviously over there for you with Hina, who's going to be very kind to share with you. The multilingual education is in general a pedagogical approach that recognizes and support, supports the use of multiple languages in teaching and obviously in learning processes. Mm, I would like to tell you that it speaks only about language, communication between humans. Let me tell you, it's not only this thing. It's even with mathematic language and even with musical language. There are a special education children. Do you remember? Almost all of us speak about people with all the capabilities for learning anything. But there are some other ones who really cannot speak because they have a problem in their body or perhaps in mind that do not process the things. Teachers, multilingual education, it includes numbers and musical signs. 
The purpose of this one is to make like this picture. Everything is a disorder in the mind sometimes. Just imagine a person like me who was at the beginning of the life trying to learn three languages, to read them, to write them, to associate it with real life and suddenly to put it in practice. As you see this picture, is exactly my mind long time ago when I was trying to process everything at the same time and I was speaking a little, we say over here the word in Spanish, a little mocho, I mean half, 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 and nothing at the same time. So language teachers are everything but nothing. They are for everybody but for nobody. They, you can see them everywhere, but they are not used nowhere. And it's really simple and complex at the same time, but the minds are really mixed up. So over here, the question is really is, why should we teach in different languages, with different strategies, with all the things that were exposed in this presentation, in this beautiful anniversary, by the way, PDC, congratulations, big hug for you. Hope everybody enjoyed. It's missing only the cake and the wine for us to say cheers. I will do it, but with water because as you can hear, my throat is a little destroyed due to the work during the work during the week. What do we have to do as teachers? The first thing is to increase the cognitive development, not only for the students, but even for us. Can you imagine saying exactly what I did at the beginning of the class? Uh, hello, hi, bonjour, uh, salut, ça va? Suddenly you say to the student, no? And they, don't you say, are you drunk, teacher? Did you smoke something? Did you drink something special? He said, no, it's because I learned no language, a new language today. Let's learn tomorrow how to say goodbye. And you invite your students to increase their memory, cognitive development, especially nowadays, as Miguel said, the use of technology is something really important, but it seems like we are forgetting to use our own brain. And we don't need to do nothing because we only press a button in our telephone and it tells us everything, how to say goodbye, and we don't have to memorize it. But what about if you make your students a kind of goal of learning a different word or even their own languages from their country. I have heard, as in Mexico, obviously, many nations have many languages. They are forgetting them. We are forgetting them. For example, over here in Mexico, when we want to say to somebody, um, the beautiful, I love you, but in Zapoteca. Zapoteco is a language that we speak in a place over here in Mexico. We say, something similar like the Chinese. So the Chinese says, Wu I mean, we say, I love you in Spanish, te amo. And suddenly in Zapoteco, Mdianala. And the guys get interested about these things. And they say, teacher, how can I say to my boyfriend, I love you? In what language did you want to say? This is going to help us in the second point, the cultural preservation. Teachers don't forget that sometimes we teach other languages from other countries to our students because we really want to do the thought, the humanistic integration, and to give them economic opportunities. Yeah, that's right. Money, 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 money. I mean, money is good. Who says no? But what about enjoying who you are? Not feeling guilty or feeling depressed because you come from another culture, from another town, and from a different language. That is something that multilingual education is going to help the children and adolescents and teenagers and adults and everybody to realize. And suddenly when I discovered that Indianala in Zapotec is so beautiful because it means something so forever and ever. I said, I want to say that word to my future partner of my life. For never to say again, I hate you, but only I love you. 
Multilingual education teachers make the people to be tolerant. Over here in my country, there are people who come from different towns to live in the city. I suppose you are living something similar. If you are having this situation, I am so sure that there is a different language, a different comment, a different expression, colloquial situations to express even different accents. And I don't know if you have noticed that sometimes when we don't know the thing, we fear about it, we laugh about it, and we make fun of it. And teenagers and children sometimes say, ha, ah, he doesn't know how to speak in this way. When we teachers included in our classroom and we allow them to be listened and we tell them, share to us your expression, make us understand it. Perhaps we can make the children to learn how to be tolerant with their partners. And if somebody is incorrect in the way they're speaking, they're going to say, that is not the correct way. Correct it. It's said like this. Yeah, for sure, language is not going to be economic opportunities to some other people. Let me tell you, in my life, with three languages and two more that I know how to read and uh, uh, how to translate, believe me, I have never suffered hunger, not even one member of my family. And it has given me a chance for me to be who I am. But if there is one story is a big story that you should know. I'm so sure because you know history. In that Second World War, where the people was not interested about learning languages that so much for fun, they said one expression. If you know the language, you will survive. Supervivence is something that people do not understand, like enjoying just because they are hungry. Now, it's because when you are speaking about learning a different language, it can give us, it can give us a, or even the chance for you to share this opportunity to travel from one part to another or from one country to another. Even if you don't have money, I send them go backpacking. And you can be a waiter, you can be a waitress, you can be a, I don't know, sweeper, you can wash dishes, you can, you can take care of children, you can be nanny, it doesn't matter. You are not stop, not only in your country, but even in other places in the world. Never get scared about that thing. Please share it to the children, share it to your students. The benefit of being multilingual, and I'm so sure for this thing, you are going to be easier to learn. You're going to make it easier. Mm -hmm. I chose this picture because it calls my attention how a plumbing group can be in a bedroom. Sometimes I feel like this, for example, when I try to speak to, to Hina, I feel like I am a plumbing group in a bedroom because I am scared. Am I speaking correctly to her? <laughs> Everyone is different and everybody belongs everywhere, but we don't know it until we try to do it. Multilingualism is going to give us this. It's going to set ourselves a flamingo in a desert, but not stopping being a flamingo, beautiful, sexy, interesting, and intelligent. And by the way, the favorite of many people. What are the historical origins of multilingual education? Well, as you know, UNESCO is one of the um, the, the, the people who have been uh, worried about how the people and the children, teenagers and all those have been doing the things. In 1999, they set this expression in order for them to make understand the associations in the society that modern song and regional or national languages are as important as international languages. Teachers is real. English is the international language to communicate with almost everybody. Yes, but let me tell you one thing. Personal, personal experience. When you go to friends, they, they rather like you to speak in French, not in English. They are expecting you to respect the languages. 
The same as other countries, they love us Mexicans, as we love all of them, and all of you too. But the idea is to have this possibility, at least to know how to manage basic situations. In the moment you are working for somebody, uh, I don't know, maybe online, or when you are sharing food with someone at a cafeteria and they don't know how to ask for the money, for the money for the food, perhaps you find a tourist. It happened to me when I was 13 years old, I came to Mexico and suddenly there were some Canadian guys, they were young, the girl was sick and she was not speaking correctly because her nose was not working fine. Nobody could understand to her. And my father just kicked in. Hey, help her. Uh, no, but I can't, no, I don't know them. Help her, she's in problems. And so when I tried to help her get her medicine, she was really, really a, happy she was thankful and she said to me can you help me go to my hotel too because nobody can understand not even my english my accent and because he am sick if i hadn't had that opportunity to be multilingual believe me i hadn't had many experiences your students need it it has the roots in various contexts because of the bilingual education the first thing remember we started being bilingual and then the language revitalization. It seems like education has been in a cycle of not ending and everything is seen. There is no more red thread under the sun and everybody knows everything and we are always bored and the children don't want to learn. So that's the reason we learned, we wanted to do some revitalization. There are many methodologies to do something, but the fashion one now, is to do it with multilingual. You want to be um, actualized teachers? Do it in different languages. Not only the ones you're teaching, just as common. And now, don't forget, the language in education policy. This is for all the countries. This is not something we want or we don't want to do. After the pandemic, it took a, a strong point for all the powerful and non-powerful powerful countries to be caring about how their society was uh, growing between one another. And let me tell you one thing they discovered. We were having meetings in Zoom like now, and we found people from other countries and we didn't know how to communicate with them. They realized we needed a strongest language. We needed the strongest education. We did, needed to modify everything to add a little of technology, a little of values, a little of history, a little of context, a little of everything. And with little, 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 they created a new language education. How are we going to do all these things? Well, it's easy. It's because when you have my multilingual education, you will find harmony in society and the taboos disappear. Mm, I cannot speak of something I, I cannot, I haven't lived and I cannot express from other people, let me tell you. I remember long, 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 long time ago, people who knew that I was learning other languages, they asked me one thing. Teacher, when you are sleeping, do you dream in another language? I don't know, what, what's your answer? If you do, please share to us in the, what, in the chat because as I remember, sometimes I dream in other languages. I, they said to me, teacher, and when you are speaking to somebody in, in English, don't you feel like you have to stop because you are like in a wheel going back and front. Is it difficult to change from English to French? How does your brain work? Don't you get confused? Well, and the most terrible question that I never dared to answer was when they asked me, teacher, because this is a culture of artists. I married to a Chinese guy a long time ago. And they said, they asked me, teacher, and when you are having a discussion, do you discuss in Spanish, in Chinese, or in English? 
And we say, come on, that is something, that is a taboo that you have in your mind that suddenly the people think that because you know different languages, maybe you are not speaking correctly or they say to me that I get problems in my tongue because even in Spanish, I have a, a, a different accent. They sometimes ask me, are you Colombian? No, maybe you're from Venezuela. No, perhaps you're from Puerto Rico. No, I'm not from anywhere. I am from Mexico. But my accent changed. People couldn't discover who I was. It that was something amazing, you know? I could enter anywhere and I can enjoy anything. And suddenly nobody could know who I was. I felt like 007, ready to enjoy the life. I don't know if you know Mr. James Bond, but 007 had the chance to share with many people. The question is, how are we going to implement the multilingualism or the multilingual education in our classrooms? Well, first of all, we have to be careful about what language models we have to, uh, we have to implement. Uh, the most convenient, I said over here, if you notice, is the language and through grade learning from the CLE. Why? Because it gives you a little of technology, a little of education, a little of comparison, a little of association. It gives you even total physical response methodology. And you can use a little of realia. You put it everything with the grammar translation method. You make your shaking. And then voila, your lesson plan gives you all the possibility for you to work with all the students from different levels and from different uh, status of learning. Don't forget we have visuals, we have musical, we have communicative ones, we have mathematical and logical ones, and the clear methodology helps you to improve all of those things. I strongly recommend you to do that. The transitional bilingual education is good either, teachers. What happened over here? Well, many times and many moments of our lives, a student said, how can I say this word in these other languages? There is always one who is not learning with the methodology and using because for any reasons, their brain works differently. Please don't get scared about using the grammar translation method. I know it's one of the oldest ones, but if in the brain of the person it works for us to hook the knowledge and to increase their level, please do it. Well, that's my personal recommendation. It helps me a lot. After that thing, the teacher training is important. Teachers, this is something that's not going to like you. I know. We are all the time studying. We are all the time trying to do our best. We want to rest, we want to enjoy. We haven't spoken about this in other com conferences, but let me tell you one thing. Studying for you as a teacher, something important. You cannot teach in multilingual purpose without knowing how to pronounce or what is the real meaning and context of the world you are going to uh, uh, teach. For example, Almost everybody in the world have heard the expression namaste. That is in another language. Sometimes when I teach my students a hello, sometimes I say a namaste, especially for the ones who practice yoga or they have this kind of religion. And they say, teacher, do you know what is the meaning? Oh, sure. I can see the essence of God in you. The translation? Literally, I see you, but the context of a namaste is, I can see the light of God in you. And I feel happy when I share this thing because, wow, how deep it is. It is. So your training teachers has to be with something professional. Sometimes we are waiting for the government to do it, teacher. Never wait for any government to do it. It's not because our governments are not good and our, um, I don't know, kings, queens, and perhaps presidents or 
ambassadors they are not good no it's because they have a lot of things to do and sometimes when we are in the classroom it's something that we have to attack immediately it's not something that we can wait until they decide to teach us nowadays students are waiting for us to design our own classes please teachers the next point is the curriculum design and the supported policies these policies may delay to arrive to other countries be innovative and do it to do it. And by the way, first ask your principal if he agrees. Other way, he's going to say, why are you doing things that I didn't order to do? Well, it happens to me many times. But if you are designing your own curriculum for your own classes and your lesson plans and your programs, personal ones, I am so sure your students are going to enjoy it a lot and you will start modifying and innovating the education step by step and making the difference in your classroom remember big works have to be done in only small pieces how do you grow a big apple tree you don't need to put the big tree over there you take only two seeds of the apple put it on the ground where nobody sees let it the sun shine water it and voila this is going to come the tree if suddenly in your schools in your countries in your nations in your towns multilingual education hasn't arrived yet teacher start doing it try to do it enjoy to do it and be the first one to do it there are the stages for us to have this program uh, these stages are over here for you to try to think if you want. The first one is for you to take uh, the learning takes place entirely in the child's home language. That stage is going to be a lot, a lot difficult for some of you. But please don't feel wrong and don't feel desperate about this. Mexico, there are many parents who send their children to bilingual schools, private ones, or suddenly they are at the secondary school because in primary and kindergarten we're supposed to teach English. But the truth is that we only give a lot of vocabulary. We don't teach English for being communicative a lot because the teachers have exactly the problem of this stage. We speak it, but no the parents. So you teach it in the school, but the children forget it at home. Perhaps what you can do is to use technology for communication, like the WhatsApp or the Messenger, other maybe by email, telling them to do a kind of poll communication with you, writing messages for them not to forget what they have done. It doesn't matter if it is not something long, it can be something short, perhaps something like, uh, hi, teacher. Good morning. How are you? And you answer into your student. Fine, thank you. What about you? I am so sure you will find the father doesn't know, mother neither, but you and the student are still in contact. Follow the rules from your school, communities, and countries. Don't forget it because teaching and being innovative doesn't mean to break the law. In the stage two teachers, you will have to build the fluency in the mother tongue and the introduction of oral in the second language. Well, nobody is fluent sometimes. It doesn't matter if we learn the languages we were children. Sometimes we get stuck, especially about thinking in two or three languages at the same time. So what I strongly recommend you is to use music and suddenly you are singing, never gonna keep you up, never gonna let you down music it's a good helper in this stage to picture perhaps read this again i am giving you hoping you like them and you enjoy them some kind of strategies as always things that help me a lot when i try to implement something innovative speaking about multilingual and i find the parents cannot speak the language i Tell them to use any app or maybe me, only me in the class. I do a kind of karaoke for them to enjoy it. And they believe me, 
try to copy the rhythm of the song. Perhaps this helps you with the fluency. In the stage, stage three, you will introduce literacy. I well, I don't know your country, but over here almost anybody likes to read. These kind of things help me when I try to students to read and write. A diary, or maybe a, I don't know, a letter to read short stories, to tell them uh, with puppets the story of Cinderella or Pinocchio, and for them to be the, the new members of the theater. Because the stage three is one of the most difficult ones. If you arrive over there, say thanks God for all the help you have given me. In the stage number four, it's something that is going to give you as a result of everything you've done in both uh, the other three stages. They are going to start changing suddenly the language. So one of our students over here in basic language uh, using multilingual education, over here in Hampton School, that is a school that I, I am the CEO. Uh, little children who are from kindergarten in the third year, they say, good morning, teacher. Como estas? A fine girl. And you? I saw the teacher. They use two languages at the same time. Teacher, yo quiero un red apple. Ah, okay. Yeah, that's good. For me, I never say my students no, only in English, only in Spanish. No, no, no. Allow the child to use both languages. We call in Spanish, they are pochos, I mean half and half. Well, it doesn't matter. Children are going to enjoy it and they are going to learn it later. Recommendations. Please, despite all the efforts, Remember, always speak to the parents. And parents and community involvement is something important. Tell the children maybe to do stickers, to label all the things in their home and say to the father, father, please now don't tell them, pass me the salt. Maybe you are using it in Spanish and you say, pasame la sal. The what? The sal. Exactly the salt, totally the opposite I am doing now. Don't forget to integrate technology teachers. There are many apps everywhere and from all around the world. Evaluate and do research. Maybe you can set in their examinations, uh, translate this word into this language and then give me the meaning in this other language. And the one of the most important, collaborate and share with your co-workers. I know it's my work, no teachers, please don't do that thing. I know you work a lot, you spend your Sundays or Saturdays and you really don't want to do nothing because you do your work and other teacher is just lazy. Sometimes we listen to these expressions over here in Mexico, but please remember it's not because of you, it's not because of the other teachers, it's because of the world of your students. So despite that thing that that angel is speaking to this side of your ear and says, no, never give nothing to the teacher. He's a bad teacher. If it is not for him, don't give it to him. Say, mm -mm, goodbye. Teacher, you have a students from sixth grade as I do. What about if we work together one project? Well, if the other teacher says, no, I'm not interested, do it by yourself. When the children notice that you are doing something different, they're going to say, teacher, can I participate in the other group? And the other teacher is going to notice that what you are doing really like the children. He's going to open. Let them the opportunity to us. You see this picture? It brought me crazy because this is what you like from different angles. Who says only one language is right? Who says only one part of our culture is right? Who says only one person who is black or white is right? Please see the light from different angles, teachers. Multilingual education allows us to do exactly this thing. 
to construct, reconstruct, to do engineering and re-engineering to all our lesson plans. And what I did yesterday is going to be improved today. And suddenly my students start singing in rap and suddenly they are painting and then they are doing some theater and they notice nothing is true is that. They have security, they have communication and voila, you have the PDC and the ICLT. You send a message about them in the WhatsApp and you say, a teacher from another town and another country who wants to have their children participating with my children, a short conversation, there is going to be somebody who is going to say, can I work with you? Let's make our children to interact via Zoom or I don't know, maybe via phone call or video, why not? Miguel told us about all the things that Microsoft has for us. You know, there is a way you can record videos to upload them and then to share with other children from the world. That would be something fantastic. I have done it. Please don't think it twice. Have multilingual education in your lesson plan. That is something that is going to help you a lot. In synthesis pictures, because what I have told you and the experiences that I have told you and the examples I have mentioned, it's you the synthesis of all the investigation that I have done for eight, eight, eight days. But remember, multilingual education is a powerful approach that recognizes the value of linguistic diversity and aims to develop a student's proficiency in multiple languages. Hina, tell me. Yeah, Ethel, actually we have time constraints. I don't feel like interrupting. It's going so very well and I'm so engrossed in the talk. But we have time constraints. So just wanted to signal you. That's it. Ah, excellent. Yeah, I am almost going to finish now. The material that I left over here, all the links that you can see in these slide pictures, is where you can find exactly the information that I synthesized with this presentation. There are the talks for you to, to, to have new ideas, fresh ideas from teachers from other countries. Because I cannot say nothing if I don't share even my knowledge to somebody else in the world. The mother tongue is important, for sure. To learn how to speak your mother tongue is better and is faster and is the most important thing at the beginning of your life, yes. But remember, we are not going to learn all the time from kindergarten book. When we start learning different languages, different topics, different stages, it's like going first preschool and then primary, then going secondary, bachelor, university, masters, doctors. Exactly the same idea. It's like learning different languages. If, if now your student is able to speak in his language, in his mother tongue, start adding an stranger language. And when he's starting communicating in, a, in that language, at another point of Chinese, everybody is interested about knowing how difficult it is to learn Chinese or Russian. I am not the best in doing that thing, but let me tell you one thing. I have learned around 50 or more words in Russian this month because many of my students have asked me how to do it. One last thing, teachers. There is a skill. Obviously, I didn't say it over here, but I share it. There is a skill called International Phonetic Alphabet for you to improve the pronunciation in one student. Remember, <coughs> learning International Phonetic Alphabet sounds is going to give you the chance for them to improve the pronunciation in any language. There is a myth. I'm not so sure if this is right. <coughs> Sorry. They say Pope Juan Pablo II from the Vatican, he used to speak 11 languages when he was alive. I don't know if it is for sure, but what I know is that he knew the International Phonetic Alphabet. 11 languages, just imagine that. <coughs> Teachers, I really appreciate your time and my thought finish it. I hope you have enjoyed this uh, presentation. And I hope to see you soon. Have a nice Sunday.
and for some of you, it's Mother's Day. Congratulations. Happy anniversary, and I'm waiting to see you soon. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Ethel. You are always a walking power pack energy dose for all of us. So thank you very much for injecting these packs of energy and positivity in all the trainees of PPDCI. It was really a power pack talk. Thank you very much for opening up this, again, important domain for all the participants. And that is why I cannot see any questions here in the chat room. So thank you very much, Ethel. And please allow me to present this. Uh, will you please stop sharing? Thank you. So allow me to present this uh, token of appreciation from our side, your membership card, and you are our educational advisor and international presenter. Thank you so very much for all the kindness you had been showing and doing for PPDCI. And this is the certificate of recognition we present to you at the eve of PPDCI anniversary. So thank you so very much and blessings, prayers for you. May we keep flourishing together. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, now as you have been through the entire conference, we are heading towards the closure ceremony of PPDCI conference. And for that matter, I request our PPDCI mentor, Madam Jenny Lewis, who is teacher of the teachers. And even I have been learning a lot from her and I'm really honored and humbled to have her with us. Madam Jenny joined us right away when we started the journey of PPDCI and since then she has been guiding and she has been a torch bearer, a beacon of light for all of us. So Madam Jenny, thank you very much for joining us today at the anniversary. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Over Anna. to you for the closure. Yes, and I recognize it's now very, very um, late for some people or, or won't they have to go to work. Um, so just to, to one, to thank PPDCI for all the amazing um, work that you've done over the last year. Um, it has been a huge celebration of learning um, to, to capture um, such a diverse lot, number of presentations tonight. I thought um, the best way to actually do this was to actually come back to talk about um, the theme of equity access and excellence because each of the presentations, although very, very different, um, actually was um, really starting to talk about uh, quite a strong student-centred approach and considering where the children or the students are at. Um, so we heard about considering ways that the students in our classrooms, their strengths, targeting their learning needs, thinking about the language and socioeconomic circumstances each of our students have, uh, access to technologies, access to understanding the knowledge and skills and the requirements that the teachers and sometimes the ministries are asking of us. Um, we were reminded very much so to catch the students on their small successes and ensure uh, every teaching moment is purposeful for every student. Um, but to come back, I think, to um, uh, what Alaya said right at the very beginning when she talked about teacher quality um, and um, what this looks like, um, it reminded very, very much of um, the OECD uh, teacher excellence work uh, that we've had for the last decade. And each of the presenters today have actually talked about in some way about teacher effectiveness um, how to perform well as a teacher and how to know that I'm actually serving each of my students well. Um, but to do that as leaders um, and, and owners of our own learning, we do actually have to be reflective in our practices. Um, we do have to think about our own personal appraisal and that of others um, looking at our own practice to improve our practice for each of our students. Um, to reflect on our own assessments on the, of our practices and therefore to start to map what we need to do in, our, in terms of our own professional development if we are to improve our practices for our students, particularly against things that were talked about tonight. So that cycle of continuing to prove ourselves, um, if we haven't got access to that learning journey that we need, 
we know that we can come to PPDCI to actually get that learning journey. And tonight we've actually had some amazing illustrations of, of that again tonight. So Ina and your team, I thank you so much for the presentations we have received um, and the richness of the discussions. All of them have talked about a very different point. And um, I again uh, congratulate you. Thank you so very much, ma'am. And please allow me to present this token of appreciation and gratitude to you for being with us and for being a guide for all of us. We have been learning a lot from you during this complete journey. Though you are in Australia, but I feel you are here in Pakistan with me. <laughs> Whenever I need you, you are there. So thank you so very much for this kindness. My pleasure. Absolute pleasure. Thank you. And here comes a certificate of recognition and we present it to you in recognition of uh, your unwavering commitment, exceptional leadership and valuable contributions. We My extend pleasure. our heartfelt appreciation to you for the dedication and efforts which have significantly enhanced our organization and positively impacted teaching fraternity around the globe, our team and the goals we have accomplished together. So thank you so very much, Ma'am Jenny. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you again to all your amazing team. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to move on further with some more sharing of the giants who had been the reason of PPDCI success. And uh, here we go with uh, Dr. Ghulam Ali Buriro. Though he has not joined us today, he is not with us in the session, but his contributions are always valuable to PPDCI. Here goes the certificate. Professor Ruban had been a speaker at our platform twice and his services and his contribution are also appreciated and they matter a lot for PPDCI. Dr. Atil Hanif had been a great, great help and support to PPDCI whenever it come up to mental well-being. It's Dr. Atil whose door I knock and he's always present. Savitlana, she was my tutor during one certification, which I did from University of Cambridge. And this is here, we present her the token of appreciation and her participation. Then Madam Sumera Omrani, though uh, she taught me back in my student age, but her support is always with me. You know, we need mentors in life who are lifelong associated, with whom we are lifelong associations. So she is one of them. Dr. Sumaira Omrani, thank you so very much for your guidance and for your contribution. Shaista Shahid, a very good friend of mine, she also had been contributing in PPDCI webinars and conferences. Asan Das, PPDCI trainee, he has been very actively participating into different sessions and he presented from our platform as well. Dr. Abdul Hamid Bawar, again, one of my teachers who is, is my mentor and still I'm associated with him. And I keep learning and keep becoming my better version. And now he's helping not only me, but PPDCI complete teaching fraternity. So thank you so very much, Dr. Abdul Hamid Pamar, for your contributions. Dr. Sahar Afshan, a very dear friend of mine who's very busy. She is head of the department in Bahia University, Karachi. She is always busy, but whenever it's called from PPDCI and from my side, she is always available. So thank you very much, Sahar. Mariam Baloch, my very dear student. She's also living her life in Italy and has a very busy schedule, but her, her contribution is always appreciated from our end. Anita Anwar, formerly working with British Council, is also collaborating with PPDCI. So thank you very much, Anita. Faza Sumbul, again, a very dear friend of mine. Her contributions are also very much valuable to PPDCI and everybody who has joined us. Naima Bra, PPDCI trainee, had been taking the trainings and finally there came a stage when she was allowed and she was encouraged to participate as a printer, presenter. So Naima, here goes your token of appreciation. Nida Faisal, thank you very much for the contribution you have been making in the success of PPDCI. Ricardo from ICLT, my colleague, had been very helpful in the last boot camp. So thank you very much, Ricardo. Mr. Bilal Khan, our manager, had been presenting from this platform many a times. Thank you so very much, Yazdan, for your support. Thank you very much, Reema, for your contribution and for doing everything and for making PPDCI a real success. So here comes nearly the end when I have presented a lot of gratitude. Let me share with every one of you, ladies and gentlemen, our organization's success lies not only in the numbers and statistics. 
we can boost them up further. But in the lives we have touched and the transformative impact we have made, we have witnessed students from underprivileged backgrounds shatter barriers. They have gained confidence and discovered their innate talents and possessions. We have seen communities come together, united by a shared vision of a brighter future built on the foundation of education. I thank you to all our team members, volunteers, supporters, and partners. I really extend my deepest gratitude for your unwavering dedication and selfless service. It is through your collective efforts that we have been able to touch the lives of so many, bringing hope, empowerment, and lasting change. As we celebrate this milestone, let us be reminded of the immense potential that lies within each person we serve and the responsibility we carry to unlock it. Together, now today, pledge together to let us continue to build bridges, tear down barriers, and create future where education is a beacon of hope for all. Thank you for being a part of this incredible journey. And here, for all of you from my side, many more years of transformative impact in community service. Happy anniversary, PPDCI. Happy anniversary, PPDCI trainees. Thank you so very much, everybody, for joining us today. I'm really honored and humbled. And the picture time, I would like you to turn on your cameras if you like. And I would like PPTCI team to please capture some memorable pictures so that these may home in the memory as the first anniversary celebration together. So turning on the cameras, check yourselves. This is also a reflective practice, you know, when you check your appearance and you turn on the cameras. So I am going to snip it in three seconds. Perfect, capture screen one, moving on to screen two. Beautiful, beautiful pictures. I would love to share them all with you. And here goes the last one. So cheers, everyone. Thank you so very much. Happy anniversary, PPDCI. Happy anniversary. See you soon, Happy inshallah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye, Bye for now. Keep growing. Keep becoming your excellent version. Blessings, prayers. Bye, blessings. Goodbye, everybody. So, hands them, everybody.